Hey peeps, welcome back to The Majesty of Reason. I'm Joe Schmid, and today I'm going to be responding to Trent Horn's response, to my response, to Trent Horn's opening statement in his debate with Alex O'Connor, or Cosmic Skeptic. This is going to be an extremely epic video, so buckle up and let's dig in. So let's get into some preliminaries. I always like to first emphasize that fundamentally our discussions here are supposed to be love oriented, right? We're supposed to be serving each other and helping each other in our pursuit of truth. And so I do want to start, as I normally do, by saying I love Trent, right? I love his attitude. I love the fact that he's a truth seeker and we're on the same team here in that regard. Second, no, I don't think the thumbnail is flattering with that big red rebutted, you know, it seems a little bit polemical if, if you ask me, but my justification is that he did it first, okay? <laughs> I feel like a kindergartner, like, Mom, he did it first, or something like that. But anyway, uh, yeah, uh, if I'm dished that, I'm going to dish it back. I probably shouldn't, but this third note here is actually false, so I'm just going to remove that. You don't have to worry about that. And now the new third note is about the format, so my sections here are going to be demarcated chronologically, and a link to this document is in the description. I highly recommend checking it out. All right, to give you a sense of the juiciness of this video, here's an outline. We're going to be talking about arguments from contingency, from change. We're going to be talking about existential inertia and models of God, Kalam, causal finitism, the unsatisfiable paradiagnosis, the gap problem, the moral argument for God. Lots of fun stuff. So let's just dig in right to it. Um, just two notes. Uh, I like his taste, first of all, because I use the argument from contingency in my debate with Randall Rouser on capturing Christianity. I can link that in the description. Uh, and then the, the second thing that I want to note with respect to this point is just that, you know, he defines the universe as the collection of all contingent things, which it's, it's not intentional, but it's somewhat misleading because uh, there can be contingent things that are outside the universe. For instance, one might think that angels are contingent things, but they aren't, you know, within the universe as we normally use the phrase. By contingent things, I mean things things whose existence depends on something else. Material objects are the easiest contingent things to understand, but there can be immaterial contingent things. Mental states would be one example. Or you could have immaterial contingent beings like an angels, because God created angels. And I understand Schmidt's concern, because when we say universe, we mean the material space-time universe. But for me, universe could include other contingent material objects that have no causal connection to our local universe. So this would include other universes in the multiverse or beings that exist but don't have spatial dimension like angels. So we might need to make a distinction between what the philosopher John Leslie calls universe with a lowercase u or a closed system of space and time and energy and matter. And so there could be a lot of those lowercase u universes and uppercase u, which is just universe, universe, capital U, everything that exists. Though I think a lot of people would probably call that multiverse or just reality, the totality of all existence, which I would argue is also contingent and does not explain its own existence. So in this clip, Trent says that X is contingent. That just means, as a definition, that X's existence depends on something other than X. Now, that's all right, right? We can define things how we like. We should keep it on our radar, however, that this is not how contingent is typically, indeed well nigh universally understood in contemporary philosophy of religion. In contemporary philosophy of religion, X is contingent just in case X exists but could have failed to exist, and X is necessary just in case X exists and cannot fail to exist. Trent isn't wrong, of course. I mean, ordinary language uses contingent in the sense of contingent upon or dependent upon. But philosophers have precisified the concept differently. Indeed, I don't quite know exactly what Trent means by necessary. I mean, if he means necessary as exclusive with contingent in his sense, then he must mean independent. But then we can't automatically infer without some additional not brought to the fore premise that the quote unquote necessary thing exists in all possible worlds, since it might be independent but exists only in some but not all worlds. It can fail to exist. By contrast, if he means cannot fail to exist, well then something can be both contingent in Trent's sense and necessary, which adds tons of confusion. Now he does go on to say that, he does try to like sort of define necessity, or at least he seems to say that um, 
something is necessary if it has to exist by its very nature. Uh, but in that case, something can be both contingent in Trent's sense and necessary in Trent's sense. Something could be such that it has to exist, that it cannot fail to exist. It's in its very nature to exist, and yet its existence could still be dependent upon something other than itself. Consider, for instance, the set containing the natural numbers, right? The set containing the natural numbers. I mean, again, set aside set theoretic realism. We're just concerned with a kind of in principle uh, counterexample. Well, quote unquote counterexample. I'm just illustrating how in principle, right, conceptually speaking, uh, Trent's definition here allows something to be both contingent and necessary, which makes things extremely confusing. So don't resist the example by saying, oh, well, there are no such things as sets. That's beside the point. So consider the set containing the natural numbers, right? So philosophers typically think that um, a set depends on its elements, right? Uh, the singleton set containing Socrates, for instance, depends on the more fundamental reality of Socrates, right? It's not as though Socrates exists because his singleton set exists. No, it's the other way around, right? There's a singleton set of Socrates, and that singleton set is there and is the way it is because of Socrates. And so similarly, the set containing the natural numbers is itself dependent on the natural numbers. But the natural numbers are necessary, right? And so the set containing them is kind of automatically there along with numbers, despite the fact that the set containing the natural numbers are dependent on them. And what this shows is that the set containing the natural numbers is necessary because it has to exist, right? It's in the very nature of the set uh, to be in all possible worlds. And yet, it's still dependent in, this, in Trent's definition of contingent, right? Because its existence depends on something other than itself, namely, its elements. And so, I just think this makes things really, con really confusing, which indicates that we shouldn't be defining necessary and contingent in this particular way. And so, you're starting to see the distinction, you're starting to see why I made the distinctions in my original video here. It's to add clarity, right? We just need to be extremely careful. And the reason we need to be extremely careful is because all these things can, at least conceptually speaking, come apart, right? So if we mean by necessary, that something cannot fail to exist, or contingent, can fail to exist, and also can exist, of course, and then dependent, so something's existence depends on another, or is owed to another, or is counted of is accounted for in terms of another, and independent, so that's just the negation of dependent. In principle, conceptually speaking, right? Conceptually speaking, each of these is a conceptual possibility, a dependent necessary thing, like the set containing the natural numbers, an independent necessary thing, like, for instance, what Trent takes God to be, a dependent contingent thing, like my laptop, or an independent contingent thing, what some atheists think the universe would be. Again, the point isn't that each of these is in fact possible. My point is simply that conceptually speaking, these are all the various arrangements of the various terms that we can have. These are the various permutations of, of the terms. And so it's ex we need to be extremely careful to disambiguate necessity and contingency on the one hand from dependency and independency <laughs> on the other hand. I probably should have said independence, but then shouldn't I have also said dependence? Anyway, we're moving on. So hereafter, I'll use X is contingent to mean X exists but can fail to exist. That is, X is possibly absent from reality. I'll use X is dependent to mean X's existence depends on something other than X. Now this will greatly increase both clarity and precision. And this is important. I'll be sure to keep things clear along the way. And finally, my point he's responding to, he as in Trent, my point he's responding to is simply that he uses universe in a non-standard, potentially misleading way. Most people would find it really strange if you said angels, demons, heaven, hell, purgatory, and so on are part of the universe. But that's precisely what Trent's view requires us to say, since such things are both contingent and dependent by Trent's lights. I should probably say Trent's definition, not view. Definition of universe, right? Definition of universe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was sort of Swinburne, but it was massively exaggerated intentionally. Okay, so. Moreover, Trent's definition of universe would entail that someone who thinks there's one or more necessarily existent foundational, that is, independent natural things, say the universal wave function, or one or more quantum fields, or one or more fundamental particles, or superstrings, or logical simples, or whatever, are not parts of the universe. But this is, once more, an exceedingly strange way of using universe. The point for now is not whether you agree with such views, of course, or even think that they're possible. The point is that the definition of a universe that Trent uses gives exceedingly counterintuitive results when we apply it to such views. Whether or not the views are true or possible is just beside the present point. Now, why is all of this important? Like, 
I probably shouldn't have started the video by talking about <laughs> these sort of conceptual distinctions, but this lays the groundwork, people, right? This is important for what we go on, because we're about to go on and talk about contingency and necessity, independence and independence and so on, right? So it's utterly crucial. It's utterly crucial to get these clear from the get-go, clear and precise. But again, why is all this important? Well, because if we arrive at a necessarily existent independent thing, then it would automatically count as beyond the universe in Trent's sense of universe. But people might forget that he's using a highly non-standard, highly counterintuitive sense of universe. And hence they might think he's proven something that is non-physical, non-natural, non-spatio-temporal, and so on. They might think, in other words, that he's proving something that transcends what we normally think universe refers to, the collection of physical, natural things, say. But he has shown no such thing merely by dint of showing that something is beyond the universe in his sense of universe. All he has shown is that there is something that is necessary, and hence that is not among the collection of contingent things. There is thus a clear opportunity for misunderstanding here, and that was my point. So let's move on to Trent's next main point. I think Schmidt and I can at least agree there is a collection of contingent objects. This computer, my YouTube channel, his YouTube channel... Uh, there's contingent things. So we can start there and then proceed with the argument asking, what is the necessary explanation for this contingent collection, even if you're not sure the collection includes the entire universe? But once you reach the point where you propose a necessary explanation for the contingent collection, then you'd have to determine if anything in the universe could be that necessary explanation. Or if you have to go with something that's even more basic or exists beyond the universe itself. And I would say the argument from contingency does not lead to something in the universe that is the necessary explanation, but only something that exists beyond the universe that can be the necessary being that explains existence. So yes, by definition, something necessary is not in the universe in trend sense, but it's a separate question whether it's a natural physical thing, say. Moving on. So one thing that I just want to caution against is that he says that there are no reasons to believe the universe is necessary. He's not saying that there are no reasons to my mind, or, you know, it seems to me that there aren't any good reasons, or, you know, things like that. Or from what I've investigated, I don't see personally any good reasons to believe that the universe is necessary. You know, he's sort of um, objectifying his, his sight. He's saying, no, there are no reasons for believing that the universe is necessary. And I do just want to caution against the sort of uh, object objectification of sight. If you're curious to know what I'm talking about with objectification of sight, definitely check out my video with Dr. Josh Rasmussen. Uh, we talked about how sight is by its very nature um, individual-based and person-based, and it's based on your position on the epistemological landscape. Also, definitely check out my uh, my previous video, Why Am I an Agnostic, with regard to the person-based nature of justification and how our sight is not and arguably should not be objectified, or so it seems to me. Wink, wink. But apart from that, he says that there are many reasons to think it's not necessary. He's going to give three. I'm just going to focus on the first one. There are good reasons to conclude that the universe as a whole is not necessary, or it could have not existed, and so its existence requires an explanation. But this, however, just misses the point. The point isn't whether there are good reasons to think the universe is not necessary. The claim to which I was responding was your claim, that is Trent's claim, that there are no good reasons to think the universe is necessary. These are wildly different claims, right? It's the difference between someone saying there are good reasons to think God doesn't exist versus there are no good reasons to think God does exist. These are wildly different, and you've entirely missed the point in your response, you as in Trent. Trent has switched gears to a wildly different claim, a claim I wasn't responding to in the relevant clip. And moreover, I mean, he, he, here's a reason to think the universe is necessary. I'm not saying the reason ultimately succeeds, but it's a reason. One, there are reasons to think there is at least one necessarily existent concrete object along the lines of contingency argument reasoning. See, for instance, Proust and Rasmussen, their book Necessary Existence. Two, there are reasons to think God doesn't exist. Three, I mean, that's... Anyway, three, there are reasons to think that if God doesn't exist, the next most plausible view of reality is one on which reality is exhausted by the universe and its contents. Four, from these it follows that either the universe or something in the universe is necessary. Now, of course, we could go further and talk about the merits of uh, Jonathan Schaffer. He's a philosopher. Jonathan Schaffer's priority monism or whatever, but I won't belabor it. I mean, just see his paper, I think. Um, monism, the priority of the whole, something like that. It's, it's published in 2010. You can find it on his website. Now, this isn't an argument, right? And nor is it me defending the necessary existence of the universe. 
I need to shout that from the rooftops because someone is going to misrepresent me in the comments section. Like, <laughs> no, anyway. Um, nor am I saying that this reason is ultimately undefeated or that it's even extremely compelling. I'm not saying those. My point is that it's a reason. And hence it's false to say, as Trent did, that there are no reasons to think the universe is necessary. Also, uh, Trent doesn't say what these quote-unquote good reasons are. Um, he tried to give some reasons in his dialogue with Alex, but I argued that those fail and he hasn't addressed them yet. Moreover, we can make judgments about the universe, even if we can only observe a small fraction of the universe. I mean, we do this all the time with science, right? We apply the laws of nature and assume they're constant throughout the entire universe. You might say the second law of thermodynamics applies to the whole universe. So if we can apply generic scientific truths to the universe as a whole, well, we should be able to us to apply general metaphysical truths to the universe as a whole, like the fact that the universe is matter and energy, a collection, and it's contingent and requires an explanation. So now let's get into the next clip. The very question at issue, though, is whether the universe is contingent. Trent has simply asserted what is to be demonstrated here. The question, why does the universe exist? It just seems intuitively to be more like the question, why is a triangle black, than the question, uh, why does a triangle have three sides? A triangle's having three sides, that's almost like uh, contained in the very definition of a triangle, right? That's sort of like an analytic truth. Uh, it's not only necessary, but it's sort of part of what we mean by triangle. Um, it's part of the essence of triangularity, as it were. And, you know, I do kind of agree with him there. Like, intuitively, it does seem to be the case that, um, you know, asking why a triangle has three sides uh, is, is a sort of categorically different question than um, asking why a you know a triangle is black and uh, likewise why the universe exists. The defender of the universe's necessary existence is probably and I think rightly not going to be convinced by that. And the reason is because you know we have a we have a we have a reasonably representative grasp of the nature or essence uh, or concept of, of triangularity uh, as such. And so we know a, a whole host of its essential properties, uh, its definition, and so on. And so of course it's going to be sort of self-evident. It's just going to fall out of the very concept or the very nature of the or the very essence of triangularity that it has three sides. But I do think the defender of the necessary existence of the universe is likely well within his or her epistemic rights of rejecting this kind of open question argument, right? Because in the case of the triangles, we have a sort of representative grasp of their nature or essence, and we can just see having three sides follows from it in a way that uh, blackness does not. But by contrast, the defender of the uh, necessary existence of the universe could just say, listen, we have no reason to think that we have a you know, a fully representative grasp of the, 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 the entire nature or essence uh, or character of the universe so as to be able to mount this kind of open question argument, right? It is only if we had such a representative grasp of its nature or essence that we could reliably and reasonably infer that the question is more like the question, uh, is a triangle black, as opposed to the question, is a triangle three-sided? So I, I do think there's a sort of undercutting defeater there, like uh, he would have to show, that is to say, Trent would have to show that we have a, you know, a sufficiently uh, representative or a sufficiently in-depth grasp of the nature or essence of the universe so as to be able to mount this open question argument. Instead, he's saying, Trent has no good reasons to believe the universe is not necessary. He's trying to give an undercutting defeater. So I do want to make a slight correction here. I did not say or imply or suggest that Trent has no good reasons for thinking the universe is non-necessary, contrary to what Trent said that I said or implied or suggested or whatever. Instead, my sole claim at this point in my earlier response video is that Trent's open question argument, that was my term, Trent's open question argument doesn't give adequate reason to think the universe is non-necessary. I did not say that Trent has no good reasons. In this case, Schmidt is building on what he said before about my lack of knowledge about the universe. He's saying comparing the universe, the comparison to a triangle is unfair, according to him, because three-sidedness is just what we mean when we say the word triangle. When I say triangle, we all know that means a three-sided shape. That a triangle has three sides is an analytic truth, or it's a truth we know just by apprehending the concept of a triangle. But Schmidt says we don't understand universes in the same way we understand triangles, so it's not a fair comparison. What this does show, though, is that the universe's existence is definitely not an analytic truth. So this is correct, but it's entirely beside the point of its metaphysical necessity, right? If there, the claim that if there's water, then there's H2O, that's not analytically true, but it's nevertheless metaphysically necessary, since water is by nature H2O. Same with God, if God exists. 
the, the statement God exists isn't true by definition or analytically true, right? Otherwise, atheists would just be confused about language. But that doesn't mean that it isn't metaphysically necessary. Like the three sides of a triangle. We can neatly answer the question, does a triangle have to have three sides by just thinking about a triangle? But you can't neatly answer the question, does the universe have to exist by just thinking about the universe? Of course, any universe you are thinking about exists, any current universe. Otherwise, there would be nothing to think about and no one doing the thinking. But the question of whether this specific universe had to exist, it's up in the air. It's certainly not obvious it must exist, and it seems more likely it doesn't have to exist. But all the same points apply to God, right? It's certainly not obvious that God must exist. The truth of the proposition that God exists doesn't follow analytically from God's definition. Now, of course, I'm not saying that um, it's not part of what it is to be God that God exists. That, that I'm, I'm not denying that, right? What I'm saying is that the truth of the proposition that God exists, like like the fact out there in the world of God's existing, that doesn't merely follow from the fact that we can define God in such and such a way, right? So that truth doesn't follow analytically from God's definition in the way that, say, uh, a, a triangle is, is three-sided, follows analytically from uh, the statement about triangles, right? Or the definition of triangles, excuse me. Otherwise, right, if this weren't, if, <laughs> I know I just screamed otherwise, but um, otherwise, right, if this were if this were false, if the truth of God's existence did follow just analytically from God's definition, well, then atheists would just be confused about language. They wouldn't even understand what they're talking about, even like in terms of just meaning, linguistics, language. And all theists would need to do to argue for God is just some linguistics. Trent also says it seems more likely it doesn't have to exist. And what I say in response is like, okay, but what's the argument, right? What's the reason? I mean, you can just flatly say it seems more likely it doesn't have to exist, but we shouldn't expect this to convince anyone. There is no justification proffered here. So let's move on to the next clip. But perhaps the universe has necessary existence, but we can't figure it out as easily as a triangle's three sides. We may not have a complete grasp of the universe in the same way we grasp a triangle. We know enough about it, but we know enough about it to ask this question. Does the universe have features that are more in common with contingent things that don't have to exist or necessary things that do have to exist? I would say the universe has much more in common with contingent things, and we'll see why this is as our rebuttal continues. Well, I would only grant that X having more in common with contingent things, as opposed to X having more in common with necessary things, is a reliable guide to discerning whether X itself is contingent or necessary. That's only a reliable guide if those other things held in common are relevant to modal status. Otherwise, if they are relevant, otherwise if they are irrelevant, to something's modal status, let me put that there. Otherwise, right, if they are irrelevant to something's modal status, why should we infer that something has the same modal status as the members of a collection C just by dint of sharing modally irrelevant features in common with things in C? The burden is on Trent, then, to prove that the features he pinpoints are modally relevant features. In fact, this line of reasoning will probably do more harm than good to Trent. For, broadly construed, God has boatloads in common in, with things that we know are contingent, right? God has a mind, knowledge, intentions, beliefs, desires, will, intellect, love, happiness, blessedness, bliss, and so on, right? Even if only analogously so, right? My point remains, since analogous predication is still literal predication, these things are still literally true of God. But everything we know of with these sorts of characteristics, or at least everything that we know of that satisfies these predicates, are uniformly contingent. By contrast, uncontroversial examples of necessary things are all pretty much uniformly abstract, causally impotent, impersonal, and so on. God rather obviously seems to have much more in common with contingent things, then. And so Trent's argument here would equally cut against his own view, it seems to me. A second criticism is just that uh, the exact same reasoning is going to apply to God's existence, right? So God, like, why does God exist? That seems to also intuitively be the same sort of question uh, as why are triangles black rather than why are triangles three-sided? We can just immediately and obviously and self-evidently see that triangles are three-sided, but it's by no means self-evident or by no means can we immediately and directly see that God exists merely from grasping God's essence. So I think this would do more harm than good because, you know, the question Ultimately, the exact same kind of open question argument applies to God's existence, right? Like, what would explain God's existence? Plausibly, he's just going to have to appeal to something like, oh, well, metaphysical necessity or pure actuality or, or what have you. But again, these aren't sort of 
self-evident in the manner that uh, you know a triangle's ha having three sides is. It seems to be much more like the triangles being black, right? This is something that we uh, we come to discover upon reflection, either philosophical reflection or metaphysical reflection or what have you. Um, it's something that we sort of come upon. We it, we don't sort of immediately perceive it as sort of flowing from the very essence or nature of the thing in question. So I do think this first kind of reason would do much more harm than good to his case. One objection to my case would be that my same reasoning about the universe being contingent could also apply to God. It goes like this. Trent says we can imagine the universe not existing, and so this shows the universe is not necessary, or that it's contingent. And so this shows something else explains why the universe exists. But it seems like we can do the same with God, right? We can imagine God not existing, and so this shows God is not necessary, or that God is contingent, and even God needs something to explain why God exists. So this clip here to me was quite strange. Trent has here articulated an objection that is completely different from the objection I articulated. I was addressing Trent's open question argument, which, roughly, reasoned that because the question, why does the universe exist, is more like the question, why is this triangle black, than it is like the question, why does a triangle have three sides, it reasoned from that to the claim that the universe's existence is contingent. But one of my rejoinders to this is that the same holds true of God, right? The question, why does God exist, is more like the question, why is this triangle black, than it is like the question, why does a triangle have three sides, right? The proposition that triangles are three-sided is true by definition. That is because of the very meaning of triangle. But the proposition that God exists isn't true by definition. Otherwise, atheists would just be confused about language. But my argument doesn't show God is contingent because we have to ask what the word God means. If God is just a being who exists for no reason and has random powers like omniscience. So Trent has constructed an objection I didn't defend and is now responding to that objection. I mean, that's okay, right? It's his video. But after playing a clip from someone else's video, I think you're expected to, well, respond to that clip, right? Also, we should at least keep in mind that all models of God, except perhaps pantheism, treat God as quote-unquote a being, right? God is something. There exists an X such that X is God. God is numerically distinct from other things, like you and me, right? God's not numerically identical to you and me, or you or me. That's all one is saying when one says God is a being. This is why everyone, Trent included, says things like God is a necessary being. Something cannot be a necessary being unless it is a being. Second, no models of God say that God has quote-unquote random powers. And finally, every model of God has to say God has no explanation, for explanation is irreflexive. And so if God had an explanation, his existence would be due to something distinct from God. But that, of course, violates God's ultimacy, which is part and parcel of what God is. Now, Trent agrees, roughly at uh, minute mark 21, uh, that the question, why does God exist, cannot have an answer. So he and I are actually on the same page here, I believe. Uh, and note for the audience that the question that we're asking here is, why, not in the sense of what are the reasons for believing, but instead in the sense of what explains or accounts for. And of course, the proviso here. I had to look that up beforehand, whether or not it was proviso or proviso. Um, you can make fun of me. Um, you should make fun of me for that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I'm not, yeah, I'm not saying Trent disagrees with this above paragraph. I'm just noting it for the audience that we should keep in mind this stuff about models of God. But anyway, let's move on to the next clip. Goldbach's conjecture has been proven to really large numbers, like 4 followed by 18 zeros, but it's not proven for every number. We don't know if the theorem is true or false, but here's the thing. We do know the conjecture is a necessary truth, so it's either true in all worlds or it's false in all worlds. We could imagine scientists telling us it's false or God telling us it's true, so we could imagine the conjecture being true and false but only one of those things we imagine is actually even possible. And the same is true of God's existence. We can imagine a universe with God and a universe without God. Well, I would say we're really more imagining the universe and adding a sign that says there is no God. So I'm not even really sure if we are imagining it, but let's suppose we can imagine God and no God. The problem is that God, by definition, is a necessary being. It's either impossible for God to exist, or it's impossible for God not to exist. So we can imagine both possibilities, but only one is truly possible. But the universe is not like God, and it's not even like Goldbach's conjecture. 
we can conceive of the universe not existing. One way we could do that is by mentally subtracting each of the objects of the contingent objects in the universe until nothing is left. So we observe objects going out of existence all the time. It's not that hard to conceive of this happening, not just to a few of them, but all of them. And if you did that, eventually you would get to a point where there's absolutely nothing. And then we'd ask the question now, well, why is there something rather than nothing? And if we did that, we would seek an explanation since things could have really been different. We want to know what explains that. So far, Trent has simply asserted that things could have really been different. From context, it's clear, to my mind at least, that he's talking about the universe, right? The universe could have really failed to be. But, of course, that's the very question at issue, right? I mean, he did point out that we can conceive of the universe's absence. I mean, sure. But Trent himself had just argued that conceivability, I know he used the term imaginability, but typically those are often used interchangeably. So I'm just going to go with conceivability here. Um, he had just argued that being able to imagine something, being able to conceive of something doesn't imply its possibility, right? I can conceive of God's non-existence. It's conceptually possible. Um, and I can conceive of Goldbach's conjecture being true or else being false. Or at least I can conceive of a possible world, uh, or at least uh, an allegedly impossible world in my conception, where some kind of horrendous evil takes place, but no outweighing good accrues as a result of it, and so on. Um, but we don't thereby have a disproof of God or proof of Goldbach's conjecture or a, a, a proof of the possibility of gratuitous evils, uh, and hence of the possible absence of a perfect being, and hence of the <laughs> non-existence of a perfect being. Um, we don't thereby have a disproof of these just because we can conceive of them, precisely because conceiving of them doesn't imply their possibility, as Trent himself seems to recognize. The important thing to see here, though, is that Trent hasn't actually given any argument for why the universe is contingent. He has simply appealed to conceivability, and in particular conceivable subtractions, which Trent seems to grant doesn't imply possibility. Finally, we should note that I'm not ultimately concerned with whether the universe might be necessary. I don't think there is such a thing as the universe. Um, <laughs> that might sound radical, but it's actually not. Um, I think that there are spatiotemporal things, yes, uh, and I think that these are related in various ways. But is there some spooky thing over and above all the... I'm waving my hands right now, and it, like you can't see it, but... I'm, I'm doing the, the usual spook thing, spooked. Um, but there is some, sp is there some spooky thing over and above all the individual things that is the universe? I doubt it. That's like thinking there's a thing composed of all and only my nose, your left shoe, Biden's two earlobes, earlobes, <laughs> loaves. <laughs> oh man. Biden's two earlobes, the Eiffel Tower, and the city of Dubai. There is no such thing composed of that, and there is no such thing as universe. The universe doesn't exist. Deal with it. Different spatiotemporal things, perhaps arranged universe-wise, that might exist. But anyway, um, uh, so again, fundamentally, I'm not really ultimately concerned with whether the universe... That was a tangent. I shouldn't have gone on that. Uh, I'm not really ultimately concerned with, uh, with whether the universe might be necessary. Instead, I'm concerned with whether something physical or natural might be necessary. The universal wave function, say... Like, you can see wave function monism in philosophy of physics and metaphysics. Or one or more foundational quantum fields. Or one or more fundamental particles, or one or more superstrings, or one or more meriological simples, or mass energy, or ontic structure. You can see, for instance, ontic structural realism in philosophy of science and metaphysics. Or the priority monist universe, or cosmos. You can see Jonathan Schaffer, or what have you, right? There are lots of options, and I'm just picking the universe because that's what Trent picked in his debate with Alex O'Connor. So, on to the next clip. Now, you might object that we don't really observe things popping out of existence, so you can't subtract objects and eventually get to nothing. We only observe fundamental particles like atoms shifting their positions. This could mean that while no object in the universe has necessary existence, the fundamental particles that make up the universe could have necessary existence, and so they must exist. But that's a very strong claim. Even here, we can conceive of these fundamental particles being different or having different properties. So first, we should note that one need only offer the claim as an undercutting defeater, something that Trent's argument would need to rule out in order to succeed, but which it doesn't adequately rule out. So whether the claim is strong is not relevant. What's relevant is whether Trent has justified its negation, since justifying its negation is what's required if Trent wants his argument to support, well, theism. Second, conceivability doesn't imply possibility, as Trent himself has argued, or at least seems to have argued in his video. And so, from the fact that we can conceive of the particles having different properties, it doesn't follow that this is in fact possible. 
And third, even if it is possible that they have different properties, this is, this is just irrelevant to their necessary existence, right? Something's being necessary is a matter of it existing in all possible worlds. That doesn't mean all of its properties are the same in all possible worlds. It only means that the entity exists in all possible worlds. It may very well vary in its accidental, that is, non-essential properties across worlds. That little bracket, that should be right there. Man, that looks so cringe without it. I, I know, that was kind of a cringy usage of cringe, but uh, we're moving on. Uh, one theory is that atoms are made up of quarks. And they have, there's these weird quarks. There's up quarks, there's down quarks. But we couldn't we've had different quarks. They could have been different. There could have been more or less types of quarks or maybe something totally different like strings, for example. And we have different string theory that operates on the principle. There are different kinds of universes that could have existed that all seems to count against the fundamental particles being necessary. So first, nothing in my proposal above hinges on the necessity of the particles. The necessary natural or just non-theistic foundation could be a whole panoply of things. And that's the could of epistemic possibility. Any argument from contingency will have to rule out each of these if it wants to infer that the necessary foundational thing or things is God. In this case, of course, it would be thing, but... Um, so first, could be a collection of mariological symbols. You can see a PhD thesis by Matteo Bonucci. Matteo Bonucci, it's a pizza pizzeria! Or it might be a collection of physical symbols, like maybe quarks or superstrings or whatever. Or maybe it's one or more foundational quantum fields, or maybe it's the universal wave function. You can see, for instance, uh, two philosophers' excellent work here, Alyssa Ney and Jill North. Um, Alyssa Ney, for instance, has a 2021 book published with Oxford University Press, uh, The World and the Wave Function, a metaphysics, of quantum, or a metaphysics for Quantum Physics. And there's also huge and blossoming literature in philosophy of physics on wave function monism. Uh, so those are four proposals there. Fifth, it might be the cosmos as a whole, along the lines of Schaffer's priority monism. I know I said earlier that I don't think there is such a thing as the universe of the cosmos. Uh, that just That's just registering my disagreement with Schaffer, but, <laughs> you know, it's at least an epistemically possible option um, that, that we can't just rule out a priori. Um, sixth, it could be an Oppian initial... Sing oh, and here's the paper. You can actually click on it and read it there. There we go. Um, it could be an Oppian initial singularity. For instance, see his paper here and his forthcoming debate book with uh, Kenny Pierce. It might be the neutral monist substance, right? We don't have to be wedded to some kind of physicalism. It could be some kind of neutral monist substance. It might be structure or structural relations. You can see, for instance, ontic structural realism. It might be dynamical physical principles as the ultimate ground. Actually, uh, philosopher David Gunn, I think it's Gunn. It might be John. John, I doubt it's John. I bet it's Gunn. I, I'm almost certain it's Gunn. You know, t if, if I'm wrong here, get a gun, okay? <laughs> I don't know. That's so stupid. Uh, so his article, it's freely available online in Philosopher's Imprint. That's the journal. It's a very prestigious journal. Where's the italics? Why can't I italicize this? Come on. Come on. Where are you? Where are you? I found you. Okay, good. You cannot escape. Um, entitled On the Ultimate Origination Thing. So he actually develops a view of the ultimate ground of reality as these dynamic physical principles. So definitely see his article there. It could be matter energy, or it could be a non-theistic version of the Neoplatonic one, which transcends all differentiation, all complexity, all multiplicity, all distinction, all qualification, and so on. It is just pure, undifferentiated unity and actuality. It's impersonal and non-mental and non-intentional and so on, right? Because if it were, uh, this is, this is Plotinus' own reason. If it were capable of thought, well, then there would be a distinction between thinker and thought, between the subject and the object, between the thinker and the intentional object. And, and yet the one, as Plotinus understands it, is utterly beyond all distinction, including the distinction between thinker and thought and thought and object of thought. And, of course, there are many, many more. I just went through 11 different proposals. Um, and, again, I'm not saying that um, Trent is, like, unaware of these or anything like that. I'm not, I'm not saying that, people. Don't read into what I'm saying. All I'm saying here is that my proposal above uh, just, it doesn't hinge on the necessity of particles, say. Uh, there are a whole panoply of things that the necessary natural or at least just non-theistic foundation could be. And this is just giving you a glimpse of those. So, and, and this is also to help people dispel with the uh, oft-repeated myth that uh, um, the only natural, the only candidate that's a, even remotely plausible for a necessary foundation is God. Like, no, no, no. Not unless you can, you know, 
rule out all of these. You know, if you want to, you can publish a paper in response to, to Graham, not you as in Trent, but you as in uh, whoever is uh, responding in the manner that I just suggested. Yeah, you can publish a paper to publish a response to Oppie's papers here. You can get delve into the literature on priority monism. You can delve into the massive literature on structural, uh, ontic structural realism. You can look into neutral monism if you want. You can publish an article in response to, to Gunn's article and so on. Um, be my guest, right? Or maybe write a PhD thesis in response to Bonocci. Um, yeah, be my guest, but don't just blithely assert that um, only uh, theism, and again, I'm not saying the trend did blithely assert this, but um, I see it online, and I'm here to combat those, uh, <laughs> combat the uh, the people who make that claim uh, online. So uh, yeah, anyway, let's move on. Second, so that was my first response. Uh, nothing in my proposal above hinges on the necessity of particles in particular. The second, Trent's own view of God faces a parody argument, right? Just replace what Trent says about quarks with the Trinitarian persons. Trent says, even here we can conceive of these fundamental particles being different or having different properties. One theory is that the atoms are made up of quarks. But couldn't we have had different quarks? Couldn't they have been different? Couldn't there have been more or fewer kinds of quarks? But there is a parody argument here. Even here, we can conceive of God being different. Like, we can at least conceive of it or having different properties. I mean, one theory is that God is Trinitarian. But couldn't we have had different divine persons? Like, couldn't they have been different? Couldn't there have been one more or one fewer divine person? Couldn't a Latin model have been true instead of a social model of the Trinity or vice versa? Um, to those of you, well, I don't know if I should get into the, the details here. A Latin model, roughly speaking, as Brian Leftow kind of characterizes it, a Latin model starts with God's unity or oneness, a very robust account of that, and tries some way to kind of tease out of that a, a threeness of the divine persons. There's a moth outside my window. I am distracted. Uh, anyway, um, and then social models, on the other hand, kind of start with God's threeness, the threeness of the divine persons, and they emphasize that, and then they try to kind of work out a way as to how those three things, quote-unquote things, they well, try to see how those three persons can be related in such a way so that you have one God. So anyway, um, there are tons of different Latin models, tons of different social models, and so on, uh, but the point for now is just that the various models are at least conceivable. Um, uh, and so, of course, the natural reply from the Trinitarian is, no, this is all necessary, right? And this isn't threatened by the fact that you can conceive of God's being Unitarian or of the Trinity's being Latin or else social instead of social or else Latin. And yet this is precisely what the proponent of the necessary non-theistic foundation will say to Trent's argument, right? So, again, whatever, you respond, whatever your response is to, to this argument, it's going to equally just substitute in um, uh, God's being different or the Trinity's being Latin or social, or there being more than three persons, just substitute that in with uh, the stuff about the quarks or, or whatever we want to take the non-theistic necessary foundation to be. So I don't think we should be sanguine about Trent's argument. That is, I don't think Trent's argument here succeeds for the reasons that I've been articulating here. And this would show the universe is contingent, and thus it needs to be explained. And this same objection cannot be deployed against God to show that God is contingent. Instead, God is the necessary being that explains all other contingent realities. But this is untrue. I just showed above how the objection does, in fact, apply to God, right? We can conceive of God being different. Indeed, we can even conceive of God's being absent from reality altogether. Or at least we can conceive a world filled with her such horrific suffering that it runs contrary to the nature of a perfect being to allow it, meaning we've conceived a world in which God doesn't exist. Trent says God is necessary and explains other contingent things, but that's precisely what the proponent of the non-theistic necessary foundation hypothesis will say, of course. So anyway, that rounds out our treatment of the argument from contingency and what Trent says in response to me in response to him. And so now let's move on to the argument from change and what Trent says in his video. This first one I really want to focus on is just that the inference to the pure actuality of the being in question is just a non sequitur on many fronts. Right, so just to restate his argument, it's just that things are changing, right, but something cannot change unless it is caused to change, right, that is to say, something cannot reduce from potency to act unless it is actualized by something already actual, uh, and these chains of changes cannot be infinitely long, and hence there exists a purely actual being uh, that causes or that stands as the terminus of such uh, hierarchically ordered or per se chains of causation, or causation of change, that is. Now, uh, like I said, there are lots of problems, but the main one that I want to focus on is just that the inference to pure actuality is a non sequitur. Right? Recall how we characterize this. One thing is changed, and in so doing, 
it is being changed by another. Okay, now focus on that other. Now it's either undergoing change right now or it's not undergoing change right now, right? Suppose it's undergoing change right now in so changing the other thing. Well, then it's going to have a further cause for its changing, right? And so now we have a sort of a regress. And in order to stop this regress, we need something that, that is an unchanged changer, right? It is changing the members uh, in this particular series without itself changing in that respect. But the mere fact that it is not itself changing in this given respect does not entail in the slightest that it has no potentials for any change whatsoever. All it entails, right? All it entails is that it is not currently changing in this present respect in order to cause the, the relevant changes in this hierarchical or per se ordered series of changes, you know, at, at this particular moment. Really, I, I do think that the, the problem really lies fundamentally in the distinction between something's being unchanged in the relevant respect and something's being unchangeable in the relevant respect. Let me restate Schmidt's objection. He's basically saying this argument shows the series of actualizers has to terminate in something that actualizes everything but isn't actualized by something else. But what Trent says in this clip is just not true, however. I did not say that the argument shows that there is an entity that actualizes everything but isn't actualized by something else. For starters, the argument, even granting all the dubious stuff about change being the actualization of potential and so on, the argument could only get us the claim that each chain of changes is such that that chain has at least one first member that changes other members of that chain without being changed in respect of the causal power or property of the chain. This doesn't mean that there is some one first member for all chains, and I didn't grant that. But Trent has here been characterizing me as granting that there is some one first member for all chains. As I've explained elsewhere, the non sequitur problem is really a plethora of problems. Now here's a very far too brief summary. Uh, this is this is from a chapter of my book here for an in-depth you could just read check click on that right this the doc, link to this document is in the description of this video and you can click on that and then just click on this and you can read an in-depth explanation and defense of these non sequiturs I, I explain them in full um, this is actually just a summary section so again this is a far too brief summary uh, but anyway I'll read it here just because I want to so thus far I've examined the criticism that the first way is invalid the recent formulation of McNabb and DeVito is only valid under certain interpretations of the conclusion and premises, interpretations that are either implausible or quite distant from classical theism. Along the way, I raised a host of new problems for Aquinas' first way by uncovering at least six non sequiturs in its reasoning, ones which have gone on or underappreciated by philosophers working on this. As we've seen, the first way only concludes that for each per se chain of changes C, there is some terminator T that is unactualized, that is unmoved or underived at time T of C in respect of the causal power or feature F of C. But the inference from this to T's being purely actual simpliciter is marred by at least six non sequiturs. One, from the fact that T is unactualized in respect F. So again, this is like the causal power of the series, like the power to heat, say. So um, from the fact that T is unactualized in respect F at time T, it doesn't follow that T is unactualized in respect F at times other than T, since there may be some T star distinct from T that serves as the terminus of C at another time, and T may be actualized in respect F at such times. But suppose it did follow. Still, too, from the fact that t is unactualized in respect f at times other than t, say, at each moment at which the relevant chain of changes c exists, it doesn't follow that t is unactualized in respect f at all times at which t exists, since perhaps c no longer exists. And so even if t is the unactualized first member of c at every time at which c exists, t may still exist after c has ceased to exist and be actualized in respect of f in another chain distinct from c so maybe a chain c star but suppose that this did follow still three from the fact that t is unactualized in respect f at all times at which t exists it doesn't follow that t is unactualizable unmovable underivable as a matter of metaphysical necessity in respect f but suppose that even did follow, right? Still, for from the fact that T is unactualizable in respect F, it doesn't follow that T is unactualizable in every single respect. That is, that T is purely actual full stop. But suppose that did follow. Still, 5, from the fact that T is unactualizable in every single respect, and hence purely actual, it doesn't follow that T is the single source or terminus of every chain of changes. That is, of all change, right? There might be whole panoplies of purely actual things, each of which stands as the terminus of the respective chains of changes and the respective causal powers of those various um, series. 
And then suppose that that did follow still six from the fact that T is a purely actual source of all change. It doesn't follow that the God of classical theism exists. That's the gap problem. And we're going to be getting to the gap problem later in this video. So yeah, once again, just read this chapter of the book. I go through these in much more detail. This is a far too brief summary, okay? Um, I'm just, I'm doing this for the sake of my sanity and so that it might pique your interest or at least the interest of those who want to pursue this further. So now let's move on to the next clip. Let me unpack this uh, through an example. So consider one series or chain of changes, right? The noodles are heated by the water, uh, which are in turn heated by the pot, which is in turn heated by the stove, which is in turn heated by the fire, and so on, right? Suppose further that this is a per se chain of changes or a hierarchical series of changes, and that such changes must terminate in an unchanged changer. Now, because per se chains of changes, right, are concurrent causal chains of hierarchical dependence at any given moment, all we could conclude here is that there's something with the power to make something else hot at time t, right, without actually deriving that power to make other things hot at t. That says nothing about other causal powers such an entity may have, right? It says nothing about whether it can, in some possible world, derive the causal power in question, but simply does not in fact, that is to say, in actuality, derive it. It says nothing about whether the, the entity has uh, the causal power non-derivatively at t, but fails to have it non-derivatively at some t prime distinct from t, when it is not so acting as the, the first cause in, in this particular series of, of heating. It also says nothing about this entity's being fully and, and purely and utterly and wholly actual, right? The entity could simply have potencies that simply have nothing to do with the relevant causal chain of changes in question, or, you know, potentials that are simply not right now reducing from potency to act or what have you. Here I think we need to be careful and not overpressing the physical examples that Aquinas and others use to illustrate the first way. For example, Schmidt uses the example of a fire lighting a stove and then asks, how do we know the cause of this chain has the ability to give fire without receiving fire from others? Maybe it only can do it at certain times. The, a similar example Aquinas uses of concurrent actualization is a stone moved by a stick, moved by an arm, and a person, and so on. These concurrent actualizations all describe action in the present moment, but they would also be extended into the past to explain why there is a stick or why there is a fire. As a result, it does not make sense to propose unchanged changers that only explain the causal chain at certain times, but not at others, because there's still a lack of explanation. But this is not true. It is not true that there is still a lack of explanation. The proposal at hand is not that there is an unchanged changer operative at t, but no unchanged changer operative at t plus 1 or t minus 1 or some other time. Rather, the point is that from the mere fact that x is an unchanged changer of the causal power or property of a series at time t, it doesn't follow that x is unchanged in all respects whatsoever at t, as opposed to being unchanged in respect of the causal power or property of the series at t or that x is unchangeable in respect of the causal power or property of the series at t, or that x is unchangeable in respect of that causal power of the series simpliciter, or that x is unchangeable in all respects whatsoever, or that x is unchangeable in all respects whatsoever and not only causes this series, but also causes all other series of changes subordinated per se, and not only that, but is the unique such cause, and so on, right? The point is that for all the argument shows, some other entity, distinct from x, might play the role of the unchanged changer at t minus 1 or t plus 1, and so on for each other time. In that case, x may very well be the unchanged changer of the causal power or property of the series at t, but x may very well change at t minus 1 or t plus 1, since it doesn't serve the explanatory role of unchanged changer at such times. For all the argument shows, that is, some other entity, x star, say, might serve that role. Importantly, it doesn't mean that nothing plays that explanatory role. Indeed, my point in the video was precisely one according to which some other entity plays the explanatory role. And so it's simply false to say, as Trent did, that there is still a lack of explanation here. Also, I'm skeptical of these there being causes like pure fire that only operate at certain times. My points didn't assume or imply or suggest there was such a thing as pure fire. Rather, it simply pointed out that all we can get to with the argument, granting its stage setting about act, potency, etc., which I wouldn't grant to begin with, but set that aside, is that there is something with the power at t to cause other things to be hot without itself needing to, to derive this power from without. 
Crucially, this does not rule out a situation in which this thing could derive the power from without at t, but does not in fact derive it from without at t. It also doesn't rule out a situation in which this thing cannot derive it from without at t, but can derive it from without at times other than t. And, indeed, it doesn't rule out a case where this thing cannot derive this power from without simpliciter, but in which this thing ceases to exist at the next moment while something else, with the relevant built-in essential power to cause heat without having to derive this from without, comes along to bestow heat to the series. And so on, right? So again, my points just didn't assume or imply or suggest that there was such a thing as pure fire. It merely pointed out that all we get to with the argument is that there is something with the power at a given time to cause other things to be hot without itself needing to derive that power from without at the respective time. That is perfectly compatible with something else coming along at the next time, say, with its own power being built in and it serving as the explanatory role that the first thing played at the previous moment, and so on, right? Just, if you want to hear the response in full, just go back and listen to me saying this. But now let's move on to the next clip from Trent. Uh, and so, just more generally then, this argument from change that he's giving just fails to deliver that the being is unchangeable or unmovable even in respect of the causal power of the chain for which it serves as primary member, right? Again, uh, in each of these changes, we're looking at a particular change of changes, in, a chain of changes in a given respect, right? Like heat, for instance. The noodles are heated by something which is in turn, in so doing, it, it has its causal power in a derivative manner, its causal power to heat. And so ultimately, we have to get to something that has the causal power to bestow to other things to heat them, right? Without itself having to have that causal power bestowed to it. So in each of these chains, we're looking at a, a relevant kind of causal power of the chain. And so this argument fails to deliver that the being, that the, the first cause in this chain is unchangeable or unmovable unmovable even in the respect of the causal power of this chain for which it serves as the primary member, right? Like, although the fire may have the ability at T to impart heat to the series without actually having heat imparted to itself, right, and thereby move others to be heated without itself being moved in such a respect, it would not follow that it is metaphysically impossible for heat to be imparted to the fire at T. And even if it did follow, right, I mean, it also wouldn't follow that the same is true for times distinct from T. And again, we're focusing on uh, a particular time because that's precisely what a per se or hierarchically ordered chain does, right? It zooms in on a concurrent chain of hierarchical dependence at any particular moment in time. And hence, we're, we're just inferring about the first member. It's causing the series at a particular time t, right? Uh, and so although the fire is unmoved at t in respect to the causal power of the series, namely heat, right? It is not thereby unmovable at t in that respect. This argument from change that he's leveling is trying to infer something uh, that is unchangeable or unmovable in the relevant respect, not merely in fact unchanged or in fact unmoved in the relevant respect. This reminds me of some objections the philosopher Anthony Kenny and others have made against the first way that misunderstands Aquinas' argument about actuality. I'm not saying Schmidt is doing this, but it reminds me of it. Uh, some critics say Aquinas is erroneously saying something that is potentially hot can only become actually hot by something that is actually hot. So like Aquinas is saying, wood can only become a bonfire when an actual fire touches the wood. Of course, even Aquinas knew you could make fire by rubbing two sticks together because the potential for the fire does lie in the friction between the pieces of wood that is actualized by the motion of something else. So thankfully, Trent didn't say I made this rather silly objection to the first way from philosopher Anthony Kenny. Kenny gives the example of someone fattening an ox as well. Uh, the cause of an ox is fattening, according to Kenny, and he's right here at least. Uh, the cause of that need not be fat in order to cause the ox to be fat. But of course, where Kenny is wrong is saying that Aquinas committed to some sort of principle along these lines. Aquinas didn't, and Kenny is wrong there. Um, but I will say, though, that... Uh, I don't know how my objection reminds him of this silly objection here, since mine is entirely separate, right? Mine is that merely from the fact that some entity is in fact unactualized in respect of the causal power or property of a series at time t, and instead has the power to cause the relevant property in other members without itself needing to be caused in the relevant respect, or without itself having to derive the relevant causal power at time t. It doesn't follow that the entity is unactualizable in respect of this causal power or property at t. In turn, Nothing follows about whether this entity is unactualizable in respect of this causal power or property at times other than t, or whether it is unactualized or unactualizable in completely unrelated respects. Unrelated, that is, to the causal power or property of this series in question, and so on. 
The problem is the inference from in fact unmoved to unmovable. This has nothing to do with Kenny's silly objection. Instead, it's building on philosopher Scott McDonald's objection in the following article, which you can read for free if you just click this. So it's an article published in the journal Medieval Philosophy and Theology in 1991, Scott MacDonald, uh, and it's called Aquinas' Parasitic Cosmological Argument. It's an excellent article. I highly recommend you guys check it out. I expand on all of this more in my chapter linked earlier, by the way. So check that out. So when Schmidt says things like fire impart heat without receiving heat at time t, that's true, but it doesn't follow that the chain of causes could be explained by a series of things that intrinsically have causal powers apart from God. Uh, so I was far more concerned, though, not with the fire deriving heat from without, but rather the fire deriving its power to heat from without, right? Quoting me from the clip. And so ultimately we have to get to something that has the causal power to bestow to other things to heat them, right, without itself having to have that causal power bestowed to it. So in each of these chains, we're looking at a relevant kind of causal power of the chain. And so this argument fails to deliver that the being, that the, the first cause in this chain is unchangeable or unmovable e unmovable even in the respect of the causal power of this chain for which it serves as the primary member, right? So here I'm talking about the power to heat not heat itself. Now, in 1,000% fairness to Trent, I did make a slip-up in the next clip, so let's listen to that. Like, although the fire may have the ability at T to impart heat to the series without actually having heat imparted to itself... So this is definitely a slip-up, right? It's a sort of... It's a, a slip-up of cosmic proportions, right? It's, it's even worse than capitalist imposing their sort of moral framework on the proletariat so that they are shackled in chains for the rest of their lives. Anyway, um, once again, I spit all over myself, so I'm probably gonna have to go clean myself up. Um, I'll be back. I'm back. Hello, everyone. Uh, I know a lot of you guys have heard my Zizek impression before, but I enjoy doing it, and I know some of you enjoy it, so if you enjoy it, I, I include it in there for you. I, you know, sometimes you have to repeat, quote unquote, you know, you have to repeat things, and anyway, I enjoy it. <laughs> I think it's stupid, but, um, anyway, we're moving on. So, yes, this is a slip up in this clip. What I should have said is not, right, I just, I clapped, is not that the fire has the power to heat other things in the series without actually having heat imparted to itself. I shouldn't have said that. Instead, what I should have said is that the fire has the power to heat other things in the series without actually having the power to heat imparted to itself. We should replace any instance where I suggest the fire has quote-unquote heat imparted to it with the power to heat imparted to it. Um, so this, I think, is what caused confusion. But once we correct my slip-up, my overall point stands, right? Merely from the fact that terminus T of chain C is unactualized in respect of the causal power P of C at time T, it doesn't follow that T is unactualizable in respect of P at time T. And nor does it follow that T is unactualizable in respect of P simpliciter, that is, at all times or else timelessly. And nor does it follow that T is unactualizable in all respects whatsoever. So here's how I put it in my book manuscript, which is slightly updated uh, compared to the linked chapter from earlier. So I say, uh, consider one such chain of changes, one we considered earlier. At time t, the noodles are heated by the water, in turn heated by the pot, in turn heated by the stove, in turn heated by the fire. Uh, suppose further that this is a per se chain of changes, and that such changes must terminate. Uh, because per se changes are concurrent chains of hierarchical dependence, all we could conclude here is that there's something with the power to make something else hot at t without actually deriving that power to make other things hot at t. This says nothing about other causal powers which such an entity may have. It says nothing about whether it can, in some possible world, derive this causal power, but simply does not in fact, that is in actuality, derive it. It says nothing about whether that the entity has the causal power non-derivatively at t, but fails to have it non-derivatively at some t prime distinct from t, and so on. It also says nothing about this entity's being fully purely actual, for the entity could have potencies that simply have nothing to do with the relevant chain of changes in question, or potentials which are simply not right now reducing from potency to act, or what have you. And if you want to read this on, you, you can, but we're just going to move on. Oh, I guess I should emphasize that the reason I included this, right, the reason I included this is to point out that my point, <laughs> even once we correct my slip-up, my overall point stands. And in my book manuscript, I actually put it in terms of deriving that power to make other things hot. Uh, I don't talk about deriving heat itself. So, um, so yeah, the, the point stands whether or not we use um, 
heat or the power to heat, but I fully acknowledge that it was a slip up, uh, uh, although um, I do talk about the power to heat. It's just I really should have been more consistent. So yeah, 100% um, uh, fairness of Trent, that's a slip up. And so, uh, but yeah, let's move on to the next clip. But let's let's just suppose, right, contrary to what I've just been arguing, that he could establish that the first member of a given Petise chain of changes has the relevant causal power in an unchangeable or unmovable manner. And not only at t, at time t, i.e. not only when the member is is causing the series in question, right, but also at every other time at which the first member exists, okay? Let's just grant that. Even then, this still wouldn't get to a purely actual being, i.e. one that's unchangeable in all respects whatsoever, since it would only entail that the terminus of the given per se chain of changes is unchangeable in respect of the causal power of that series, heat, say, or, you know, some other causal power or feature. But this is perfectly compatible with such a being having other potentials, unrelated to the causal power of the series for which the being stands as the terminus, that are simply presently unactualized, they're not presently being actualized, or are not required to be actualized, for the being to serve as the terminus of the per se chain in question, right? We might try to say, like, we might try to use, um, agade sequitur esse, I probably pronounce that wrong, but, um, I'll just save that if he wants to, uh, use that in response if, if he ends up seeing this video, but I, I do not think that that kind of attempted patch, uh, would be convincing. So we're back to Schmidt's objection, his original objection, which is essentially this. Why couldn't this argument prove that there are lots of unmoved movers? Maybe there's a cause that is pure fire that causes all fires, but it has other potentialities. Okay, so that's not at all what I was saying, right? No one said or suggested or intimated that maybe there is a cause which is pure fire that causes all other fires, but it has other potentialities, right? That's not at all what I was saying. The suggestion instead is that the first member of the given per se chain of changes we're considering, the noodles heated by the water at tea, in turn heated by the pot at tea, in turn heated by the stove at tea, in turn heated by the fire at tea, not only has the relevant causal power of being able to heat the other members in the chain in an unmoved or underived way at tea, but also has this causal power in an unmovable or underivable way at t. And not only that, but also has this causal power in an unmovable or underivable way simpliciter. That is, not just at t, and indeed not just at times for which this member serves as the terminus of the relevant chain of changes. This has nothing to do with something being pure fire, right? All it means is that it has the relevant causal power in an unmovable, underivable manner simpliciter. I then go on to point out that the proposition that the first member of this chain has the causal power of the chain in an unmovable, underivable manner simpliciter does not entail the proposition that the first member of this chain has no potentials whatsoever. For example, potentials wholly unrelated to the causal power of the relevant chain. Or maybe there is a cause that is pure light that causes all light, but it has no other abilities. It just has a bunch of potentials. Uh, so I'm astounded by this a little bit. Uh, nor did I suggest anything like this, as I explained above. So let's move on. The objection basically says, all I've proven is that there must be something that actualizes causal chains, but I have not proven this actualizer has divine attributes like unity, simplicity, omnipotence, things like that. So here I just say, what? I mean, that's not even close to the objection, right? I wasn't talking about divine attributes at all. My objection instead was that even, even we granted, even if we granted, man, uh, even if we granted, which as I've argued we shouldn't, that one, the first member T of a particular chain C has the causal power P of C, in an unmovable, underivable, that is, unactualizable manner simpliciter, it does not follow from that that, two, t is unmovable or unactualizable in all respects whatsoever. This has nothing to do with divine attributes. It has to do with a clear non sequitur from one to two. Two just doesn't follow from one. Only, only two allows us to infer that t is purely actual. But one is perfectly compatible with t having potentials in respects other than p. T could be unactualizable in respect of P, but actualizable in respect of some other feature or power, P star. More accurately, nothing Trent says justifies ruling this out, which is what he would need to do if he wanted his case to go through. Now, in my opening statement, I talked about change in general, but one element of change I could have explicitly noted is the change a thing undergoes when it has continued existence. So persistence isn't change, it's the absence of change. 
If an apple continues to be red, it doesn't change in respect of redness. It's only if the apple becomes blue or orange or pink, say, that it changes. Similarly, if an apple continues to exist, it doesn't change in respect of its existence. There's simply no change here. Change involves going from being not F to being F, or vice versa. But persistence simply involves, quote unquote, going from existing to existing. That isn't change. That's just a case of staying or remaining F. Case, case, case. <laughs> I know there was a quasi voice crack there, but um, just got to make fun of it, man. Even if there were some fundamental causes of matter, which I'm agnostic about, but these causes and these beings would still require explanations for what actualizes their own existence. What makes it the case that these actualizers have their potential to exist actualized at any given moment? So there are whole swaths of inertialist, existential inertialist friendly explanations of objects, objects' existence at non-first moments of their existence. The explanandum Trent points to an object's existence at a given moment of its existence, need not be explained by appeal to a sustaining efficient cause. There are a whole host of explanations that make no appeal to causes. See section 5 of my blog post, So You Think You Understand Existential Inertia. Extremely briefly, indeed far too briefly, here's a summary of each family of accounts. One, a tendency or disposition to persist in existence, a la tendency disposition accounts, or perhaps the lack of a tendency to just spontaneously seize in conjunction with... Um, the absence of uh, causally inducing factors that, that cause it to see, so destructive factors. B, transtemporal explanatory relations obtaining among the, among the successive stages of objects' lives or among their temporal parts, a la transtemporal accounts. C, laws of nature that gotherwise, gotherwise. I just said gotherwise. Dear gosh. Uh, laws of nature that govern or otherwise explain the evolution of systems and or objects over time, a la law-based accounts. D, the primitive metaphysical necessity of the inertial thesis. E, the metaphysically necessary existence of some foundational temporal concrete object or objects. F, uh, persistence being the absence of change, and so adequately explained by the absence of sufficiently destructive change-inducing factors, and so on. In any case, let's move on. And right, like, even if we granted, right, even if we granted um, a, a purely actual being, right, I, I mean, I've just given uh, lots of reasons to think that that's a non sequitur on many fronts, given his argument from change, but even if we granted that, we still wouldn't be able to uh, arrive at there's this one source of all change. Because all the argument shows is that each chain must be finite, such that, you know, for each chain it must have a first member. But from that we cannot infer that there is a single first member for all such chains, right? That's, um, that's just a quantifier shift fallacy. Schmidt is saying the argument from motion commits the quantifier shift fallacy because according to him, the argument from motion apparently says... Every change has a single unactualized actualizer. Therefore, there is a single unactualized actualizer for every change. But the argument doesn't make this move. What it does say is that any time a being undergoes change, that change must be actualized by something that is actual. However, anything doing this kind of actualization would either be pure actuality itself or it would have some potential to exist being actualized by something else. Again, this is exceedingly strange. Trent is here presenting a different argument from the one he presented in his opening statement with Alex. His argument in the debate with Alex was concerned with change or motion. He made no reference whatsoever to the actualization of potentials for existence. So if Trent wants to abandon his argument there, or render it parasitic on another argument, namely the Aristotelian proof, which is an existential argument that is focused on explaining the existence of something, as opposed to a mere argument from change, which is non-existential, I mean, that's fine by me, right? But then Trent has conceded my principal contention, that the argument in Trent's opening statement by itself doesn't work. What's more, I've already addressed the existence-focused argument ad nauseum elsewhere. It's just the Aristotelian proof, and it fails. I've published two papers on it and have a book manuscript wherein I discuss it for, like, six chapters. I think it might actually be more than that. Um, I've addressed it in YouTube videos and scholarly blog posts, uh, moreover. Uh, once more, here are the resources from my previous video responding to Trent with regard to the Aristotelian proof, my IJPR paper, my SOFIA paper, um... Phaser on Schmidt on the uh, Aristotelian proof, Phaser on, uh, on Schmidt on existential inertia, comprehensive response. I highly recommend checking both of these out. So you think you understand existential inertia, that's... <laughs> you need to read that. Uh, <laughs> Phaser's Aristotelian proof and analysis. This chapter of my book, Systematically Praising the Aristotelian Proof, which is slightly updated since I made the link, blah, blah, blah. I will also briefly address what Trent says in the clip. 
So he says anything doing this kind of actualization would either be pure actuality itself, or it would have some potential to exist being actualized by something else. But this is rather clearly a false dichotomy. There could easily be a non-purely actual thing which nevertheless has no potential to exist that could be actualized. Consider, for instance, a view of God on which God is necessarily existent, immutable, timeless, impassable, but nevertheless has some potential for cross-world variance in non-essential properties, say, different intentions, or different knowledge states, or different acts of will across possible worlds. In this case, God isn't purely actual. He has potential to vary across worlds. But it is obvious that in this case, God also has no quote-unquote potential for existence, since he is necessarily actually existent, and hence has no potentials pertaining to his sheer being, that is, his very existence. Yes, he has potentials pertaining to his non-essential properties, but that's utterly separate from him having potentials pertaining to his sheer substantial existence. And this point, of course, generalizes to any foundational being or beings, whether theistic or non-theistic, that are one, necessarily actual, and yet two, have potency either for cross-world variance or for change, or both. For in such cases, the being or beings in question have no potential pertaining to their sheer existence. They are necessarily and wholly actual in respect of their very being or existence, though not wholly actual or wholly or purely actual in other respects. And so Trent's claim is simply false. It's a false dichotomy. Because continued existence represents a change that occurs in the series, you would eventually need something that is pure actuality to account for for this aspect of change in the causal series. So continued existence isn't change, it's the absence of change, right? Continued redness isn't a change, it's something's remaining red. Uh, by contrast, if something stopped being red, that would indeed be a change. But something's remaining red isn't a change. By the exact same token, continued existence isn't a change. It's something remaining in existence. By contrast, if something stopped existing, well, yeah, yeah that would indeed be a change. But something's remaining in existence isn't a change. In fact, this actually leads to an argument for the existential inertia thesis from the Aristotelian proof's causal principle. You can see my video response to Trent Horn here. This is my, the one that I made previously, just really recently. Even setting aside Trent's false claim here, it's just false that the only way to explain S's existence at a given non-first moment of its existence is by appeal to a concurrent sustaining efficient cause. There are instead, as I've emphasized, whole swaths of inertia, existential inertialist friendly explanations. See the stuff from earlier. But now let's move on to another clip. And so, you know, one way he might try to patch this up is to say like, oh, well, we can actually get that it's the, uh, the, you know, the first cause of all the chains by inferring there only could be one purely actual being. I don't personally see any problem in, in principle for there, be, for there to be more than one purely actual being, right? I mean, like Phaser, for instance, his argument for the uniqueness of a purely actual being, he argues that for there to be two or more purely actual beings, a differentiating feature must obtain between them, but there can only be such a differentiating feature if a purely actual actualizer had some unactualized potential, which, you know, obviously it's, it's purely actual, so it doesn't have that. Um, but, you know, this is just not convincing in my estimation, right? I mean, a differentiating feature could easily be had in terms of some difference in actual features between the two things. Like an elephant and an amoeba and a planet, for instance, are distinguished by many th features other than unrealized potentials. And, you know, while, while having different actual features entails that one being does not have the feature that the other has, the mere absence of a feature, right, does not entail potentially having that feature. I don't have the feature being made entirely of platinum, for instance, but I'm not even potentially made entirely of platinum. Platinum. Schmidt's argument seems to be that you could have two purely actual beings, so the argument doesn't get you the classical view of God. He says these beings would be actual just in different ways, and neither would be actual in the same way, but they're both purely actual. But then what's the difference between these two purely actual beings? You'd have to say, well, one purely actual cause lacks feature X, while the other purely actual cause lacks feature Y. But now you're talking about purely actual things not actually having something, which are potentials that distinguish them as two separate beings, so neither is going to be purely actual. Now, Schmidt says, well, maybe that's not really in their potential at all, because it isn't in accord with their nature. Like how Schmidt can't be said, he doesn't even have the potential to be made of platinum and be human. But let's follow this line of thought. It's not a part of my human nature to infallibly know the future, but God could supernaturally reveal the future to me. My ignorance of the future, therefore, is a real potential in me, even though it doesn't properly belong to my human nature to achieve that through natural means. 
So let me stop you there, home dog. Right? We're using essential in different senses. When I say f is essential to x, or that x is essentially or naturally f, I'm saying in part that necessarily, if x exists, x is f. In other words, x cannot exist without also being f. By contrast, when Trent says f is essential to x, or that x is essentially or naturally f, he's saying in part that fness is proper to or characteristic of the kind of thing x is. It doesn't mean, under this view, that whatever belongs to that kind must, as a matter of metaphysical necessity, be f in order to fall within that kind, or to have that essence. But, crucially, once we make this disambiguation, we can see that Trent's point in the clip is irrelevant to my point. For in my sense of essential, it is not essential to us, under theism, that we are ignorant of the future, precisely because it's possible for us to know the future, if, say, God revealed it to us. But other things are such that we essentially lack them, even in, you know, in my sense of the word, right? For instance, even God couldn't make me be composed only of platinum, devoid even of a soul. I am therefore essentially not made entirely of platinum. Note, too, that I'm not imposing my definition of essential on Trent, right? We could just call my notion essential if we want, right? My point in response to Phaser and Trent remains, right? Phaser says that there would have to be a differentiating feature in virtue of which two purely actual beings are distinct, in which case one would have some f that the other doesn't have. But then the one that doesn't have it would have some potential, since it lacks f. But this is utterly false, for if being f is shm essential to x, and being not f is shm essential to y, then y does not even have the potential to be f, even though it lacks f. And so my point remains untouched. Now, in my book, I consider someone asking, well, without one of the purely actual beings having potency, what could differentiate them, right? In virtue of what could they be individuated? Well, in the book, I respond as follows, with some additions of Trent to make it germane to the present context. So I have three responses. First, many philosophers think the identity of indiscernibles is false, since individuation or distinctness is or can be primitive. In that case, there need not be... So don't worry, people, I'm going to define identity of indiscernibles in a second, so just hang tight. Um, so first, many philosophers think that the identity of indiscernibles is false, since individuation or distinctness is or can be primitive. In that case, there need not be some feature that grounds things as distinction. At the very least, we need some positive argument in favor of the principle, since the onus of justification in this context is on Phaser, or in this case Trent, to positively demonstrate uniqueness. Second, the problem of Trinitarianism rears its head. If the Father and Son are purely actual, what distinguishes them, right? If, if having some distinguishing feature entailed potency, as would need to be the case for the present worry to have teeth, then no purely actual thing could be Trinitarian. So here's my digression on the identity of indiscernibles. So there is a regress argument against the identity of indiscernibles, and by many philosophers' lights. Uh, it's, well, I, IOI, this looks like a lull, but it's not, it's IOI, um, I don't even discern this. Uh, it's a very controversial principle, uh, but there is indeed a regress argument against it. And given that Phaser's and Trent's inference, uh, or, yeah, given that Phaser's inference requires IOI, we have yet a further reason to doubt Phaser's inference to uniqueness. As I put it in my video arguments for classical theism in part one out of two, um, the identity of indiscernibles states that for any feature f and anything x and anything y, if it is the case that x is f, if and only if y is f, well then x is identical to y. In other words, if x is distinct from y, well then there's some feature which individuates x from y. That is, some feature x has that y lacks, or else some feature y has that x lacks. That's what this fancy formula is just saying. More concretely, and applied to this context, in order for there to be more of one x, there would have to be some differentiating feature in virtue of which the x's are distinct. Otherwise, there would be nothing in virtue of which, so the argument goes, otherwise there would be nothing in virtue of which they are individuated or distinct or multiple, in which case their distinction is inexplicable or brute. But having such a differentiating feature, so the argument goes, is incompatible with being simple, and indeed being purely actual, since then it would have some positive ontological item, this feature with which it is distinct. It's also incompatible with being pure essay itself, or pure being itself, since then it would be being itself, or essay, plus some individuating feature. But the problem is that many philosophers think that individuation is primitive. There need not be anything in virtue of which things are distinct. Here's a kind of infinite regress argument, right? In virtue of what are those features of X and Y individuated, right? We can just ask the same thing of those features. If there's nothing in virtue of which they're individuated, well, then we just have primitive individuation, which is precisely what IOI sought to avoid. And if they have some further differentiating feature, well, then we're off on a vicious regress, right? We could just ask of those features, of those further features, right? Uh, they're either going to be primitive or, you know, they, there's some further differentiating feature. And then we're off on a vicious regress. And so we must therefore bottom out, it seems, in primitive individuation. 
And so uh, that's the main thrust of this thing. I mean, you might just say, oh, well, no, it's not primitive because um, one of the objects has f and the other one lacks f. And, you know, there's nothing primitive about the difference between something being f and something being not f. Well, I mean, <laughs> then you can just apply that exact same response to x is being distinct from y. I mean, if x is distinct from y, then x is not y. So then all you need to do is say that x is x and y is not x. That's, that's all that you need to say. It's the exact same response there. So anyway, um, this, this, uh, infinite regress argument is, is interesting and I, I, uh, want you guys to think about it, reflect on it. So, uh, the, so that's one thing. That's the one thing that I want to say in my digression. Uh, but the second thing that I want to say is that, again, we can, we can just run the exact same argument, uh, and get the denial of Trinitarianism, right? In order for there to be one or more divine persons, there would have to be some differentiating feature in virtue of which they're distinct. But then the divine persons would no longer be pure being itself, and hence no longer be divine, since then they would be being itself plus some differentiating feature. And moreover, this differentiating feature would be something intrinsic to God, but distinct from God, contra divine simplicity, and so on. But anyway, that's the end of di the digression. Remember, to situate you guys, uh, in this book, or in my book, I consider someone who asks this question here. Without one of the purely actual beings having potency, what could differentiate them? Like, in virtue of what are they individuated? And then I have three responses. I gave my first response, that uh, uh, arguably there need not be anything in virtue of which they're individuated, because distinctness is, or at least can be, primitive, if we deny the identity of indiscernibles, which there's at least a reasonable argument against it. So that's my first response. Uh, my second response is, um, well, somehow I skipped down to a third here, so I'm going to have to pause this and go back to see what my other responses were. Oh, okay, so yeah, I'm, I, this is the second response. What am I doing? <laughs> the two is looking me right in the face. Um, yeah, this is my second response here. It's antithetical to Trinitarianism, so those first two responses. And then here's the third response. So third, some difference in actual, not potential features of the purely actual beings could individuate them. Suppose that one purely actual being is a timeless, non spatial temporal universal wave function we can call Bob. Bob is timeless, and so immutable, and so has no potential for change. And we can also suppose that all of Bob's features are essential to Bob, in which case Bob has no potential for cross-world variance. So Bob is purely actual simpliciter. Suppose that Bob has a probability distribution d for giving rise to such and such quantum fields. Now just imagine another non-spatiotemporal universal wave function called Fred that has a different probability distribution d star. Say, instead of having a 1% objective probabilistic causal power, as Bob does to bring about quantum field q, Fred has a 2% probability here. We here have a feature that individuates Bob and Fred, namely d versus d star. And this doesn't by itself entail potency in Bob or Fred. Note that all we need to do in this dialectical context is provide a coherent counterexample to the claim that the only individuating features could be potencies, right? We don't need to justify or defend our counterexamples as, as true or possible, okay? Now, one might object at this point that Bob and Fred in the previous scenario would be composite and that this entails the possession of potency. For example, perhaps they're parts of the potential to be separated. So I have three replies. First, it's not clear that Bob and Fred must be composite. Perhaps they're numerically identical to everything intrinsic to them, in which case they would not be composite, per the classical theistic understanding of parthood. Now, you might think it's obvious that, say, Bob couldn't be identical with D, and that Fred couldn't be identical with D to star. But many find it equally as obvious that God couldn't be identical with his omniscience, omnipotence, goodness, aseity, necessary existence, timelessness, and so on. Arguably, the moves classical theists make to respond to charges along the lines of omniscience is obviously distinct from omnipotence will equally equip us with moves in response to charges along the lines of Bob or Fred is obviously distinct from D slash D star. Second, I think it's false that composition entails potency. Consider the number, consider, consider the number two. The number two has various properties, such as the property being even. But anything with various properties is a composite thing by the lights of those who accept a broadly classical theistic understanding of parthood, right? This is why uh, classical theists deny that God has a multiplicity of properties. Uh, instead, he's just identical to his omniscience. He is his omniscience. He is his wisdom. He is uh, so, on down the so on down the list. Of course, God satisfies, um, he satisfies a multiplicity of predicates, right? So a multiplicity of predicates are true of him, but they're true of him in virtue of his one undivided being, right? And so it's not as though these multiplicity of predicates correspond to a multiplicity of properties as positive ontological items in extramental reality uh, that are distinct in God. Okay, so uh, importantly though, the number two has various properties. It's a property being even, being the successor of one, and so on, being abstract, being non-causal, and, and so on. And so it's a composite thing. But the various parts of the number two do not have the potential to be separated, right? Since the number two, if it exists, would be a necessary thing, right? It wouldn't just happen to exist in some worlds and not others. Moreover, all the intrinsic properties of the number two, like being a number, 
being even, and so on, are essential to the number 2, in which case it has no inherent potencies. The number 2 then is both composite and devoid of potency. Potency, therefore, does not follow upon composition. And I have a footnote here. Again, whether you think the number 2 exists is utterly irrelevant. It's utterly irrelevant, okay, since we are concerned with, in principle, counterexamples. Counterexamples is something in principle. Whether or not they're true or possible is beside the point. So, more generally, we see nothing wrong, or at least I see nothing wrong, with Bob or Fred being necessarily existent beings, all of whose features are essential to them. And this would mean that Bob and Fred are purely actual despite being composite. If, of course, we grant that they're a composite in the first place, which I argued above that we don't need to. So, third, we can simplify. <laughs> simplify. Third, we can simply modify the scenario to avoid composition altogether. At least by phasers and trents, and other Christian classical theists' lights, phasers and trents and other Christian classical theist slights, the fact that a purely actual being is Trinitarian doesn't entail that it is composite. But then it would seem intolerably arbitrary to suppose that a Unitarian or Binitarian or, or Tetratarian purely actual being, otherwise qualitatively identical to Phasers and Trent's Trinitarian purely actual being, must be composite, right? That would be utterly arbitrary. Oh no, a Trinitarian purely actual being wouldn't be composite, but a Unitarian one would. It's like, what? <laughs> no. Um, so uh, we could therefore simply suppose that Bob and Fred are qualitatively identical to the classical theistic God, except that Bob is binitarian, or perhaps unitarian, whereas Fred is trinitarian. And here we have more than one purely actual, non-composite being with individuating features between them. Mic drop. <laughs> so on to the next clip. So I would say most people would consider two allegedly purely actual beings that lack certain actual features that distinguish them to not be purely actual at all. Uh, that's why there can only be, if there's a purely actual cause, there's only going to be one of them. So Trent says most people would consider such and such, and he goes on, but I say, brah, like, <laughs> first, this is just a flat assertion. Second, I don't quite care whether most people would say this, right? I care about what's true and what we have reason to believe. Third, most people, if they have any sense to them, of course, will recognize that they cannot be made entirely of platinum, or made entirely of scorching hot plasma from the sun's interior, or made entirely of water. Thus, most people agree that they lack various features, such as the feature being of being made entirely of platinum, that they don't even have the potential to have. Moreover, most people, again, if they have any sense to them, will recognize that they cannot have the feature of being numerically identical to Donald Trump. The one exception here is, of course, Donald Trump himself. So if he's watching this video, um, firstly, the probability of that is probably negative. But uh, setting that aside, um, anyway, most people, if they have any sense to them, will recognize that they cannot have the feature of being numerically identical to Donald Trump. And thus, most people will recognize that they lack a feature that they don't even have the potential to have. Thus, merely from the fact that X lacks F, it doesn't follow that X is potentially F. And thus, merely from the fact that one purely actual being lacks F, while the other has F, it doesn't follow that the first purely actual being is potentially F. So let's move on to another clip. We also have other reasons to believe there could only be one purely actual actualizer. For example, if there were two of these beings, then they would have to belong to a genus or a species. They would belong to a kind that preceded them. But the problem here is that this is just flatly asserted. Why would they have to belong to a common species or genus? I mean, merely from the fact that they're both purely actual, it doesn't follow that they belong to a common species or genus or kind that precedes them. That's like saying because both God and humans are both actually existent, they must belong to a common species or genus or kind that preceded them. So, unless Trent wants to give up on God's being purely actual, he can't use this line of reasoning consistently. I also already address an appeal, at least Phaser's appeal, to kinds in my book. And what I say applies there applies, well, what I say there applies here, mutatis mutandis. And thus, Phaser, so anyway, thus, this is what I write. Um, he writes thusly. Uh, so, Phaser also argues for uniqueness as follows. For there to be more than one thing of a certain kind, there must be a distinction between the thing and the species of which it is a member, or between the species and its genus. And there can be no such distinction without there also being a distinction between a thing's potentialities and its actualities. But first, we've been given no reason as to why purely actual beings would all fall within a kind. Second, no reason is given as to why distinction between a thing and its species of which it is a member, or between the species and its genus, would entail potencies. 
The genus and species could simply be wholly actual, at least for all Phaser says, right? For all Phaser is justified, and for all Trent has said, the genus and species could simply be wholly actual, with no potential to begin or seize or vary or admit of different specific differences. Phaser gives an example of a genus, animality, which stands in potency to rationality, as animality has the potential also to have, say, dogness as a specific difference instead. But no reason is given as to why this entails potencies within a genus not admitting of alternative specific differences. Moreover, even if Phaser's argument succeeds, it would only entail that a genus, or if we're talking about the relation between a species uh, and members, a species has potencies. Nothing automatically or necessarily follows about the particular concrete things within the genus having potencies, or at least Phaser has not shown that this follows therefrom. Finally, this line of argumentation likewise poses a problem for Trinitarianism, right? Under Trinitarianism, there's more than one member of the quote-unquote kind divine person, in which case there must be some privation or perfection in per Phaser's reasoning and Trent's reasoning potency that one divine person has that the others lack, or perhaps all of them would have to have some potency because they all belong to this kind, allegedly. But that would, of course, entail potency within God, and that's incompatible with classical theism. And, importantly, right, listen here, uh, if you deny that divine persons make up a kind, why not deny the same thing of purely actual beings? What reason do you have for making that restriction? Again, what this shows us is that merely from the fact that x1, x2, and x3 are all f, namely they're all divine persons, it doesn't follow that there is some kind being a divine person or some genus being a divine person that they all fall under. But that shows us that, again, merely from the fact that x1 and x2 or x3 or x4 or x5 and so on, merely from the fact that they all are all f, they all satisfy some predicate, say, it doesn't follow that they all belong to a kind that corresponds to that predicate, or a genus that corresponds to that predicate. So anyway, this argument doesn't work. Okay, so let's move on. Their essence in that kind would have to be joined to existence in order to make them real. So first, this is just a flat assertion. Second, it presupposes whole panoplies of metaphysical commitments about essence and existence, including, for example, ontological pluralism, which most contemporary metaphysicians, we should at least note, reject. You can see my discussion with Dr. Trenton Merricks. Uh, these are, what Trent says here, presupposes whole panoplies of metaphysical commitments uh, that Trent leaves entirely unjustified. And since his case here requires them to be justified, but doesn't justify them, it follows that his case here doesn't work. Third, so those are my first two responses. Third, nothing Trent says rules out either of the following scenarios, which he would need to rule out in order to infer the uniqueness of a purely actual being based on considerations of the essence-existence distinction. So one, a situation wherein each purely actual thing, each purely actual, gosh, each purely actual thing is such that its own essence and existence are necessarily united, without having to be united by some extrinsic cause. In this case, the mere distinction between essence and existence wouldn't entail potency for existence being actualized. And two, a situation wherein each purely actual thing is such that its essence is identical to its own act of existence, which are numerically distinct acts of existence from one another, right? As I point out in my video on arguments for classical theism part one, um, arguments from essence existence distinction, they admit that there are, roughly speaking, different acts of existence, right? My act of existence is not the same as God's act of existence, with which God is identical. Uh, for if they were the same, well, then God would be an internal principle that composes me as an essence existence composite, which is clearly contrary to classical theism. But in that case, God is identical not to the existence shared in common among you and me and trees and particles and whatnot. He's identical to his own act of existence. But in that case, it's not at all clear why there cannot be two things which are identical to their respective acts of existence. For they could presumably each be identical to their own respective acts of existence, which are different from one another. Remember, the, the Dante argument itself, or at least the essence-existence distinction argument itself, already grants that there are different acts of existence. For example, gods and ours. So that's uh, a second thing that I would say here. Uh, oh, and I guess a third one, right? So I think I said maybe two? Oh no. So yeah, he nothing Trent says rules out either of the following three scenarios. So rules out any of the following three scenarios, uh, which he would need to rule out in order to infer the uniqueness of a purely actual being. Uh, so here's the third one, a Trinitarian purely actual being in which essence and existence are identical, on the one hand, and on the other hand, a Unitarian purely actual being in which essence and existence are identical. So again, the onus is not on me to prove that these are possible, right? The onus is on Trent, the one arguing that we can demonstrate the uniqueness of a purely actual being to prove that these are impossible. Nothing in his argument does that. And yet his argument would need to do that for the inference to uniqueness to succeed. Hence, his inference to uniqueness fails. Second, two purely actual beings 
they'd have to exist in a common framework that is more fundamental than either of them. And as a result, this common framework, that would be the real actualizer of them and reality as a whole, not the two separate beings that, that inhabit it. So I already addressed this argument in my response to Trent's debate with Ben Watkins, but I, I honestly can't resist responding to it here. So, um, so yeah, first, it's just a bold assertion. Like, why would they have to exist in a common framework that's more fundamental than them? Why would they need to exist in a common framework at all? Indeed, what even is a framework? Uh, and if they do have to exist in a framework, whatever that is, why couldn't it be equally as fundamental as them? The most important thing to see here is that Trent just flatly asserts that they would have to exist in a common framework, whatever that means. And that which is flatly asserted is flatly dismissed. And yes, I just flatly asserted that. Deal with it. Second, there's a parody argument that disproves Trinitarianism, right? Also, if there are more than one purely actual divine person, they would all have to exist in a common framework that's more fundamental than them. And so they could not be pure actuality, and hence they wouldn't even be divine after all under classical theism. Anyway, I don't think this argument for uniqueness works. Let's move on. My point is, even if you don't accept the argument for motion, you should accept that if a purely actual actualizer exists, then it would have the properties we normally associate with God, like oneness and simplicity. My point is that Trent's reasons for this claim fail, and so you shouldn't accept that a purely actual actualizer would be God. The inferences here, or more accurately, phasers and Trent's, are typically quite shoddy, as I argue in 4.3 of this blog post, and, it, and as I've been arguing up here and throughout this section. So uh, moving on to the next clip. Moreover, this line of argument, if successful, spells disaster, it seems to me, for Trinitarian conceptions of God, according to which there are three persons in one God. According to Phaser, in order for there to be more than one type of, or more than one thing of a, of a given kind, right, so in order for there to be more than one divine person, say, let's just apply to that, there would have to be some differentiating feature that one had that the others lacked. In which case, according to Phaser's own reasoning, uh, at least one of the divine persons must have some unactualized potential. Um, and that spells disaster on two fronts, right? I mean, obviously, since the divine persons are intrinsic to God, that would entail that God has potential intrinsic to him, which is incompatible with his being purely actual. But it would also entail that these persons are not divine after all, because God is supposed to be purely actual, but per Phaser's reasoning, right, at least one of these divine persons would have an unactualized potential uh, in order to sort of differentiate them from one another. Now, you might just say, like, oh, well, hold on. They can be differentiated by something other than an unactualized potential. Yes, that's my point, right? That's why the original argument that Phaser offered fails, um, because they can be, things can be differentiated in terms of things that aren't unactualized potentials, and hence his argument for the, the uniqueness of the purely actual being, in my estimation, fails. And so what that tells us is that well, obviously, you know, this, this isn't representative of all arguments for the uniqueness of a purely actual being. But, you know, one simple way that we might try to infer it seems not to work. This objection says that Christian theology undermines the case for a purely actual actualizer, or the case for there being one God. After all, if we can distinguish the members of the Trinity, even though they are all purely actual, then why couldn't we make the same distinction between two purely actual actualizers, or more than two? The answer is that classical Christian theism does not hold that the members of the Trinity are separate, purely actual beings we distinguish from one another. The Trinitarian relations in God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they only represent relational differences in that which is pure actuality. They do not represent any differences in being or between beings. So this is irrelevant to my argument. My argument didn't at all rest on the Trinitarian persons being beings in their own right. Of course there's a difference between A, there being more than one entirely disjoint purely actual beings, and B, there being more than one purely actual divine persons. But the question is whether this is a difference that makes a difference. And the whole point of my argument is that it isn't, right? The reason that it isn't a difference that makes a difference is because the argument from distinction to individuating feature to potency is a perfectly general one. In other words, the justification for each step in the argument is perfectly general, and hence one cannot simultaneously accept the argument as applied to distinct purely actual beings, but deny the argument as applied to distinct purely actual divine persons. The argument runs roughly as follows. For there to be two or more x's, there would have to be something in virtue of which the two or more x's are distinct, that is, some feature that one of the x's has that the other lacks, or others. But this would entail that the x which lacks the relevant feature has potency, 
But whatever is purely actual cannot have potency, and hence there cannot be two or more purely actual beings. But notice that this argument is perfectly general, and the reasons favoring each step equally favor each step in the parity argument is applied to purely actual divine persons, right? The step from distinction to individuating feature is justified by rejecting inexplicability, right? The idea is that if x and y were distinct, but there was no feature in virtue of which they're distinct, then the fact that they're distinct would be inexplicable. The, this rejection of inexplicability is perfectly general, applying no matter what x and y are. The step from individuating feature to potency, moreover, is likewise perfectly general, since it's simply reasoned from the fact that one of the x's lacks f, while the other x has f, to the conclusion that the first x has some potential. Again, absolutely nothing in this reasoning is tied to x and y being beings, and so Trent's point here fails. Divine simplicity fundamentally holds that God is not composed of anything. And the Trinity does not say that God is composed of three persons, but that God just is three persons. So there is no contradiction. It's not comparable to any distinction we would make between two separate, purely actual beings, if such a state of affairs could happen, which I argue it can't. So first, whether divine simplicity is compatible with Trinitarianism seems to me beside the point. I didn't argue in the clip that they're incompatible. For those interested in investigating whether they are, see the discussion slash debate on my channel between Ryan Mullins and Rob Coons on whether divine simplicity is compatible with Trinitarianism. It was quite awesome, and it's been actually, it's doing really well. I think it has like six or seven thousand views or something like that, which is pretty cool. Um, and then you can also check out my blog post, some short quasi-tensions between divine simplicity and Trinitarianism. Second, as I've explained, nothing in my argument rests on treating divine persons as comparable with separate, purely actual beings. Instead, it points out that the reasons for thinking that there couldn't be separate, purely actual beings equally imply that there couldn't be distinct, purely actual divine persons. Alright, mate, on to existential inertia, are they? So, um, let's listen to his clip here. And hence, you know, there is this quantifier shift fallacy, I don't even have that on there, but I probably should have put that on there, right, that we can't infer that even if we get to this purely actual being, which I have argued is a, is a non-sequitur non -sequitur on multiple fronts, even if we could get to it, right, the mere fact that for each chain there's a first member of that chain, it simply doesn't follow that that, that, that particular first member is the first member for all chains uh, in question. So it, it, we can't infer that it's the singular source of, of all change. The second thing that I have on there is uh, existential inertia. Trent actually didn't present his uh, argument in terms of the concurrent actualization of a thing's potential for existence. Um, he was he actually just restricted himself to change and sources of change, and hence, um, you know, I probably could have could have left this out. But uh, if he did want to extend his argument to concurrent actualizations of a thing's potential, um, I would definitely advise uh, all you listeners to check out uh, the work that um, I've I've done on uh, existential inertia on my blog and in some of my videos. And uh, recently, uh, exciting news that you know a lot of you probably saw that on Facebook is that um, my paper, uh, Existential Inertia and the Aristotelian Proof, has been accepted at um, International Journal for Philosophy of Religion. I don't know when it's going to be ready for, like, uh, you know, production, but sometime within the next uh, couple of months, hopefully. So keep your eyes peeled for that. I'll probably do a video on that on its own. But I did want to just flag this as a, as a response to uh, the argument from change if he's trying to derive not only a source of change, but also the source of the existence of things. Uh, that would definitely pose uh, an undercutting and arguably rebutting defeater for uh, his argument there. Existential inertia deals with the question of not why things exist per se, but why they continue to exist. The argument for motion shows not only that God caused the universe to exist in the past, but that God keeps everything in the universe in existence through every moment of time. No, no it doesn't. Uh, the argument for motion that Trent gave in his opening statement with Alex made absolutely no reference to the concurrent actualization of something's potential for existence. It simply focused on the changes things undergo. And as we saw earlier in this document, persistence is not a change, and hence Trent Trent's claim here is simply false. But those who defend existential inertia, like Schmid, say objects simply have a tendency to stay in existence. So this is imprecise, as it depends on what one means by tendency. Many metaphysical accounts of the existential inertia thesis make no appeal whatsoever to tendencies, and hence don't commit to there being some tendency had by objects to persist. Indeed, uh, Bodouin's account, for instance, just adduces the absence of a tendency to expire in conjunction with the absence of uh, destructive factors operative. And so 
what I want to say here is a note for Trent, right? If I say in my video that those interested in the existential inertia thesis should check out the work that I've done on my blog for more on existential inertia thesis, then it's only fitting for Trent, who is making a response to the video, to go to my blog and check out the work that I've done on existential inertia. In particular, my blog post, So You Think You Understand Existential Inertia, which had been out for a whole month prior to Trent's response video here, has already corrected Trent's imprecision in the video clip I just played. And this leads me to think that he didn't check out my other work on existential inertia, or at least didn't check it, check it out in the depth I would expect of someone trying to respond to me on existential inertia. So that's just a note that I would say to Trent and to others who are aiming to make a response. Like, this is just a general rule, right, about responding to people. Obviously a rule of thumb, right? I mean, there are, uh, you know, defeasible considerations. But let's move on to the next clip. And so God is not needed to explain this fact of reality. But objections from existential inertia against the argument from motion, they often fall victim to a kind of circular reasoning that is necessary to establish the premise of existential inertia in the first place. So the Catholic philosopher Edward Fazer, he puts it this way, quote, attributes are metaphysically dependent on the substances that have them. Hence, we would have a scenario in which a substance depends for its continued existence on its attribute of existential inertia, and its attribute of existential inertia, in turn, depends for its continued existence on the subs on the substance which has it. <laughs> okay, I get, reading this, you can see I was angry when I wrote this, but I'm not going to be angry when I'm when I'm speaking this because I'm in a very relaxed, you know, manner. Uh, manner. What does manner mean? I I'm a very I'm in a very relaxed mood right now. So I said, bruh, <laughs> maybe. If you're going to use Fazer's argument here in response to me, try to see if I've already addressed the argument, right? Perhaps addressed it ad nauseum. <laughs> you can so tell that I was angry. I'm going to delete that. Trent is drawing on a paper published August 6th here, and I did a commentary on that paper on my blog on August 6th as well. I had already, so I addressed the argument therein. Moreover, I'd already addressed Fazer's circularity argument at the beginning of July in my blog post here and here, and I'd already addressed it on July 31st here. And so I say here that there's no excuse for Trent completely ignoring my work in response to this argument. Anyway, I will address the argument yet again here because many who are watching this video have likely not heard a response to it. And so here's how I put it in my other video, uh, my most recent, well, not my most recent, but one of my most recent videos responding to Trent Orn uh, and his debate uh, with Ben Watkins. So uh, let's just listen to me, you know, presenting it there. Trent then rehashes Fazer's argument that EIT existential inertia entails a vicious circle. It doesn't. I've shown this ad nauseum elsewhere. In fact, this almost made the top of my list as the biggest mistakes made by critics of existential inertia. He argues that existential inertia would have to be a property, but properties depend on their substances. Um, but yet the property is supposed to be explaining the existence and or maybe persistence of the substance. Um, in which case you have a kind of vicious circle. Um, firstly, it's a mistake to say that existential inertia is a property. Um, Ed Fraser, for instance, has had this. So this is from that blog post that I had. So you think you understand existential inertia. Um, Ed Fraser has said this, and, you know, uh, Trent is borrowing from Fraser's argument here. And I've argued at length that he's mistaken on many fronts here. The first mistake in this thought is its failure to disambiguate existential inertia. Uh, it could refer either to the thesis or the phenomenon. The former obviously isn't a property, right? It's just a thesis that purports to describe the way that things persist. But the phenomenon of inertial persistence by itself doesn't entail that there is some property exemplified by concrete objects corresponding to or accounting for inertial persistence. What would such a property even amount to? What, the property of being such as to persist in the absence of both external sustenance and sufficiently destructive factors, that's a ludicrously gerrymandered property. There is no such property as that. Moreover, nothing in EIT, the thesis, as such entails that inertial persistence is a property or attribute exemplified by temporal concreta. Uh, it's, and as we'll see when discuss, as we've seen so far, um, when we discuss metaphysical accounts of EIT, we see that it's simply false that existential inertia thesis requires there to be some attribute or property corresponding to inertial persistence and which accounts for their inertial persistence. And here is why trends, that is, Fazer's vicious circularity argument fails. So I already kind of explained it there, but um, I'll explain it further in what I say below, because this is important that you understand it. So um, Fazer charges that EIT is viciously circular, applying his objection to an example of a contingent substance, namely water. He writes, existential inertia would be a property or power of the water. So the water's persistence from T minus 1 to T would, on this account, depend on, the on this property or power. But properties and powers depend for their reality on the substances that possess them. So we seem to have a situation where the water's persistence depends on that of a property or power, which in turn depends on the persistence of the water. Now I have several responses to this vicious circularity objection. Ah, uh, 
Man, I need to go get a charger. Okay. Peeps, we're almost done. I got my charger. Uh, things sound a little bit differently because I had to move. Um, I had to move in order to be able to plug this in. Um, so, okay, I have several responses to this. First, few, if any, of the metaphysical accounts of EIT developed in my chapter 5, and in particular in section 5 of that blog post, treat inertial persistence as a property or power of substances. Right? Disposition, tendency, tendency disposition accounts can be cast in metaphysically lightweight terms that commit to the existence of neither a property nor power corresponding to inertial persistence. In fact, Bodoin's tendency disposition account merely cited the absence of a tendency to expire in conjunction with the non-exercise of potentially destructive factors. Again, see that blog post, section 5. Similarly, transtemporal accounts, like the transtemporal explanations, which I'm going to point to below, do not postulate a property or power of a substance that explains its persistence. Instead, what explains persistence is trans transtemporal explanatory, for example, causal connections that relate the successive phases of, phases of objects as lives. Law-based accounts cite laws of nature, and many such accounts do not treat laws as properties or powers of substances. Clearly, neither objectual, objectual nor propositional necessity accounts treat inertial persistence as a property or power of substances. And finally, no-change accounts, like the no-change explanations adduced below, uh, make no appeal to properties or powers of substances. And so, Fazer's criticism and Trent's criticism here has no teeth against existential inertia. To drive this point home, consider again, let's consider an explanandum and two explanands. These are just two out of the panoply of inertialist-friendly explanations of persistence. So, here's the explanation of the thing that we want to explain. S is existence, so S is a substance, M is a moment, okay? So, the explanandum is S is existence at M. Now, here's an explanation for that. One, there is an absence of sufficiently destructive causally, <laughs> there is an absence of sufficiently causally destructive factors operative on S from M minus 1 to M, where M minus 1 is the moment immediately prior to M. And two, the state and or existence of temporal concrete objects, or at least those within EIT's quantificational domain, at a given moment at which they exist, causally produces their existence at the next moment, provided that no sufficiently causally destructive factors are operative. Uh, you can see that footnote later. And then, so that's one, one kind of explanations that we might proffer. Again, my point here is not to positively justify the explanations, it's just to point out that there are perfectly consistent, inertialist-friendly explanations of persistence that aren't viciously circular. There, there's nothing vicious... Uh, anyway, I'll get to that, but there's nothing viciously circular in either of these. Now consider this explanation. One, S existed immediately before M, that is, at M minus 1. Two, if S existed immediately before M, but fails to exist at M, then S's cessation is, or involves, or entails a change. Three, nothing causally induces S's cessation at M minus 1 or M, that is, nothing, nothing destroyed S from the immediately prior moment M minus 1 through M. And four, a change occurs only if some factor causally induces Induces said change. Uh, again, you can see earlier in this, uh, earlier in my video here, where I pointed you guys to certain objections. You know, remember when I was talking about how uh, the causal principle of the Aristotelian proof entails existential inertia? That's going to be relevant here as well, because I go through different objections to this p potential explanations. But the objections don't work, so you don't really have to worry too much about it. But uh, if you're curious to look into it, you can you can do that. Uh, so, for Phaser's circularity objection to work, and for Trent's circularity objection to work, the explanatory facts in each explanance here must presuppose the explanatorily or ontologically prior obtaining of the explanandum. But that is simply untrue. It's clear from inspection that neither transtemporal explanance nor no-change explanance presuppose the prior reality or obtaining of explanandum. In other words, none of the explanatory facts are dependent upon S's existence at M. And in that case, Phaser's and Trent's allegation of viciously circular explanatory dependence has no teeth against such explanants. It is simply false of both explanants that there is some property or power that both explains and is explained by some fact. And the other metaphysical accounts likewise do not fall prey to charges of vicious circularity. Again, see my blog post. Section 5. Here's another response to Phaser's, Phaser's and Trent's vicious circularity charge. Suppose, contrary to what I believe, that existential inertia is a property. This would only be problematic if we accepted the controversial thesis that properties ground character. That is, that it is in virtue of possessing, exemplifying, or instantiating, say, the property redness, that something is red. But suppose we reject this thesis and instead adopt its opposite. It is rather in virtue of being red that something possesses the property redness. Under this anti-character grounding view, it is simply false, Pache, Phaser, and Trent, that existential inertia as being a property entails that the water exists at M or persists from M minus 1 to M because it has the property of existential inertia. Rather, the substance has the property of existential inertia because it exists at M or persists from M minus 1 to M in an inertial fashion. So even if tr existential inertia were a property, by the way, it's not, Phaser's argument and Trent's argument still fails. 
So Trent then goes on to talk about the difference between a unicorn, a stegosaurus, and a horse to illustrate the essence-existence distinction, and he also goes on to talk about entropy. I won't address those here since I already addressed his arguments and points here in my response to Trent Horn's debate with Ben Watkins at CCV1 conference. Um, so you can see the final section of that video, which isn't long, by the way, uh, entitled Trent's Second Rebuttal. But now let's move on to Models of God. The third thing that I have there is just the gap problem, but, uh, you know, he goes through, I don't think I don't think they succeed, which is why I th still think it's a gap problem. But, you know, to be fair to him, he goes through different divine attributes and argues, it, you know, he at least gives arguments uh, as to why the purely actual being must must have the features in question. Um, but uh, given that they don't succeed, which I will be arguing uh, in due time in, the, in this video, you know, the gap problem is definitely is definitely alive and well for this for this argument. That is to say, inferring a religiously significant uh, divine reality from a fact of, you know, a purely actual source of change. Uh, and then finally, Morian problems. So uh, I explain what I mean by a Morian problem in my my last video on why my why am I an agnostic? Uh, essentially, it's just you adduce independent arguments that show the conclusion to be false, and hence you can just infer the uh, disjunction and the negations of the of the premises. I think I've spent like 40 minutes discussing what I found personally convincing to me against this classical theistic conception of God, uh, God as uh, ipsum esse subsistens, and God as uh, purely actual. I discussed my primary concerns with that in that previous video. You can look at the timestamps in the description. It was roughly 40 minutes where I was giving a sort of sustained critique of that kind of being. So definitely check that out. I won't really go into it much in here but what's interesting about schmidt is that he believes the god of classical theism which is simple timeless changeless is less likely to exist than the god of say someone like william lane craig or richard swinburne that is not absolutely simple or timeless now i don't know if schmidt has ever made this exact comparison but he seems to endorse the view that if God existed, he would not be like Aquinas' concept of God. So I say this much is true. Um, you can see my videos, Arguments for Classical Theism, Part 1 out of 2, Arguments for Classical Theism, Part 2 out of 2, Arguments Against Classical Theism, Part 1 out of 3. Um, these are like super rigorous and in-depth, by the way. Parts 2 and 3 are coming sometime in the next months. I mean, I don't know. These videos take dozens, uh, if not hundreds, actually hundreds of hours of research and whatnot, since I have to read actual books and papers in preparation for them, and then reference the books and articles and spell out their arguments and so on, and indeed give my own commentary on them. Uh, and I've made some headway on Part 2 here, but it's still a major work in progress. I have to read a lot on impassibility for Part 2, so uh, it's taking a while, plus like life. So, uh, and boatloads more um, that I've done in this regard. So you can see my lengthy blog posts on um, classical theism or my video answering classical theist objections to neoclassical theism or <laughs> many etc. In that respect, God would be more like us, creatures uh, in time uh, and a single being among other beings. So first, if I were a theist, I would affirm divine Two time what what am I doing, dude? You can t totally tell that I wrote this when I was like brain dead. But uh, so first, if I were a theist, I would affirm divine timelessness if eternalism or some other static view of time were true. Um, whether I affirm timelessness would depend on temporal ontology, since if time is dynamic, the truths or facts themselves change, in which case any omniscient being likewise changes, since knowledge is factive and hence it tracks the truth or facts. In which case, if the latter change the knowledge thereof likewise changes. You can see my previous response to Trent for a slightly more careful articulation, or my blog posts where I, I've gone into lots of depth about this argument and objections to it. Um, there too. <laughs> objections there too. I love it. I love it. Oh man. It's like there from, or precisify, or even better, precisification. Oh my goodness, it gets me tingling. Okay, I should stop. <laughs> um, this is very titillating. Uh, so, I would affirm divine temporality if a dynamic view of time is true, but divine timelessness if a static view of time is true. So that's my first point that I just want to say here. But second, I don't quite understand. Uh, this is just a confession. I don't quite understand what God would be a single being among other beings means. Um, for starters, and to reiterate what I said earlier, all models of God, except perhaps pantheism, treat God as a being, right? God is something. There is an X such that X is God. God's numerically distinct from other things like you and me, right? He's also singular, so he isn't a plurality, right? That's all that we're saying when we're saying that God is a being or a single being. And this is why everyone, Trent included, says things like God is a necessary being. Something can't be a necessary being if it's not a being in the first place. So uh, even under classical theism, right, God is a single being. Now, Trent doesn't explain what 
this locution among other beings means, uh, and nor for that matter do most other Thomists who use this phrase, maybe they just mean God's essence isn't numerically identical to his existence under non-classical theistic views. Um, that's true, but it's entirely uninteresting, right? That just amounts to stating that they're non-classical theistic views, which we already knew. So anyway, let's move on to uh, the next clip. So I just find that it's interesting because I think concept of concepts of God that are more foreign to our experience have a better chance of explaining all of reality than other concepts of God that basically turn God into a creature like us that happens to have inexplicable powers and abilities. But this, it seems to me, is a misrepresentation of non-classical theistic models of God. Trent can correct me if he's not trying to characterize non-classical theistic models of God or represent them, but it certainly seems as though he is. And if he is, it's certainly a misrepresentation, right? Non-classical theistic models of God don't say that God has inexplicable powers or abilities. In fact, the powers and abilities of the non-classical theistic God and classical theistic God are practically identical along every dimension. Omnipotence, omniscience, omnibenevolence, essential moral perfection, perfectly rational, or perfect rationality, perfect freedom, intellect and will, the ground of being, right? On both cases, the ultimate foundation from which everything else derives its existence is God. God is the creator and sustainer of all else. God is independent and ase. God is necessarily existent. He's perfect and unlimited. He's omnipresent. He's immaterial. And so on. <laughs> Ad nauseum, right? And so, uh, it's not as though God has inexplicable powers and abilities under non-classical theistic models of God. The powers and abilities are like almost exactly the same as in classical theism. Um, also, Trent just flatly asserts that they make God, that such models make God into a creature. And of course, that which is flatly asserted is flatly dismissed. Uh, what's more, there's nothing creaturely about the above list of predicates satisfied by both the classical theist and non-classical theistic God. Creatures are imperfect, limited, contingent, dependent. God, whether classical theist or non-classical theistic models, is perfect, unlimited, necessary, and independent. There's nothing creaturely about that. For those interested, Ryan Mullins uh, came on my channel to dispense with these mistaken claims about non-classical theistic models of God being, or making God into a creature. In our video here, you can click that. Roll, please. We're on to the Kalam causal finitism and the UPD. Okay, so, okay, so I, if we can pay the theories. Uh, anyway, let's listen to uh, Trent. So then, he tries to argue for causal finitism by means of the paper passer paradox. And roughly, there are two reasons for this. So first of all, this is going to have to rely on a Patrick principle. So a Patrick principle, these things derive from David Lewis, I believe, uh, and they're essentially both modal epistemological and modal metaphysical tools. What we do is we essentially take an isolated closed pocket, as it were. It could be a, a paper passer, an individual paper passer, say, uh, with its intrinsic causal powers. We sort of specify the intrinsic nature and character of the thing in question, and we see that it's an isolated possibility, okay? And then what we do is we take a, a different possible world where we have a sort of uh, spatiotemporal framework. And this provides a sort of framework where we can we can sort of patch things in. We can fill in that world with isolated different patchworks. And so it's almost like you're sort of patching together a quilt, as it were. That's really, I think, where the name comes from, right? You take a sort of possible world that has a spatiotemporal framework that has enough room, as it were, to fit the, the possible world that you want to construct. And then you take different uh, isolated possibilities and you sort of patch and stitch them together in this possible world and you sort of rearrange things. And um, uh, so long as, you know, you don't violate any, so long as it's like logically possible, you don't violate any mathematical axioms and it's like, space and time permitting and like geometry permitting. Arguments against an infinite past uh, usually take this form, okay? So premise one, if the past were infinite, then situation X would be possible. Premise two, situation X is impossible. Therefore, an infinite past is impossible. This takes on a lot of forms from things like Hilbert's Hotel, where you have an infinite number of rooms in the hotel that even if they were fully occupied, you could always accommodate an infinite number of new guests, for example, or things like Robert Kuhn's paper passer thought experiment. The objection basically says, look, your argument, Trent, only proves that infinite hotels or infinite paper passers are impossible, not that an infinite past itself is impossible. So what Kuhn says to get around this objection is that there isn't anything contradictory about paper passers over a small window of time, let's say a few years. And if we can gradually extend that into the infinite past, then we can say any impossibility in that scenario must lie in the notion of the infinite past itself, not the paper passers. So I'll let Schmidt explain this a little bit more, but that's what he's talking about when he mentions the patchwork principle. All right, so here's a super important note before we proceed. 
Since making my video response to Trent's opening statement with Alex O'Connor over a year ago, I've studied Benedetti paradoxes and causal finitism in much greater detail, even publishing an article forthcoming in the journal Air Kentness uh, entitled A Step-by-Step -Step Argument for Causal Finitism. I have therefore come to articulate problems for the argument for classical theism from the Benedetti paradoxes that by my lights are even stronger than the ones I develop in the video to which Trent is responding. For instance, I've come to appreciate the force behind the objection from the unsatisfiable pair diagnosis, and I've also come to appreciate the force behind the objection from symmetrical, future-oriented Benedetti paradoxes. For those wanting to pursue my responses further, see the Kalam section of my recent response video to Trent's debate with Ben Watkins. Therein I link to further resources. And you can also check out my Kalam playlist in particular. Meta point here, peeps. Check out my playlists and whatnot. They're, they're interesting. They kind of organize my videos. I'm going to make them a little bit more organized, hopefully in the coming weeks or months or something like that. But some of them are, are really well organized, like my Kalam playlist. Like that one has all the stuff that I've done on Kalam. Um, so yeah, check that out uh, and, and so on. Uh, now let's move on to this rather long clip from Trent. What the Patrick principle says is that it would thereby be a possible world that you have just constructed. If you have enough room, if you have the spatiotemporal framework, and you're patching these isolated things together uh, with their intrinsic causal powers, then you're thereby sort of constructing, as it were, a new possible world. And it follows that that world would be possible. And so the reason he requires this Pat Patrick principle is actually, um, well, first of all, both Proust and Kuhn's explicitly say that they need the Patrick principles for the for the paradoxes to succeed. So that's the first thing. But um, I guess I should, you know, really give you the <laughs> give you the philosophical reason, not just to appeal to uh, what the arguers themselves are saying. So the reason we need it, the Patrick principles, because Trent requires for his argument to succeed, he needs a premise to the effect of if infinite causal chains are possible, then it would be possible to construct such a paradoxical scenario. And since, you know, you can't construct that paradoxical scenario, it's contradictory, right? Uh, it would follow by modus tollens that infinite causal chains are not possible. But the principal motivation for that first premise, right, if infinite causal chains are possible, then you could construct infinite causal chains in a way so as to get this paradoxical result, that centrally hinges on the Patrick principle, right? Because, I mean, clearly this kind of contradictory series is not actualized in the, in the real world, right? So we have to move to a different possible world. Uh, what we have to do is we have to um, we have to rearrange things in such a way, space and time permitting, uh, and we have to sort of insert them into these various nodes in the causal nexus, and only then can we really infer that from the fact that there is uh, an infinite causal chain, we get uh, that we can construct uh, a possible world that is sort of contradictory in this manner, right? It is by means of the Patrick principle that we take the possibility of there being an infinite causal chain, and we sort of uh, abstract the particular nodes within that network, right? Um, and we, we substitute in these paper passers, right? So Okay, so we're back to the main beef. Is the paper passer thought experiment a paradox only because it takes place over an infinite amount of time? Or is there something about the thought experiment that would violate the overarching rules of consistency that would govern any infinite past if such a past really could exist? Of course, there's no way to test this in the real world. So we have to do a conceptual analysis of a possible world to answer the question. And Schmidt says the conceptual analysis relies on a flawed principle. Uh, so far, he hasn't given us a reason to think the principle is flawed, but he will. So let's examine those reasons. Uh, we look at this infinite causal chain in one possible world. We use that as our framework world. And then we sort of take the little causal nodes that everything in that world was occupying, that infinite causal chain, and we sort of patch in. Uh, an obviously possible singular paper passer, right? So we can easily patch in one of them because clearly in our world, like two of these paper passers could do their job. That'd be, that'd be pretty easy. Uh, and so clearly these are isolated possibilities, right? They have intrinsic causal powers of writing things on the papers and passing them and so on. Uh, and so what we can do is we can take this world, we can take this, um, this framework, and then we can use the Patrick principle to patch up the world so as to, you know, put the isolated paper passers and duplicate them and situate them within each of the nodes in this infinite causal nexus. And thereby, we would only then, only then would we get this contradiction, right? So we have to use this Patrick principle in order to infer from the possibility of an infinite causal chain to uh, the possibility that there could be, there could be this paradoxical scenario, right? But the trouble is, is that Patrick principles are extremely contestable and pose lots of problems for theism. Now, what Schmidt will do is essentially a reductio ad absurdum. He would say, if the Patrick principle could be used to generate paradoxical scenarios, impossible worlds we know can exist, then there must be something wrong with the Patrick principle itself. 
So the strength of his argument will rely on whether these analogies are sufficiently analogous to the paper passer thought experiment. Well, actually, there are a lot of related problems. So first of all, think about David Lewis and think about his response to time travel paradoxes, right? So David Lewis, uh, I think he famously thought that, you know, time travel is possible. You know, obviously, there is a sort of grandpar grandfather paradox, right? Well, if time travel is possible, you could go into the past. And, you know, you obviously have the causal power to pull your trigger, uh, pull a trigger and get a gun and shoot your grandfather. But that's not possible, right? Because your grandfather was was a sort of necessary condition for bringing you into existence. But now somehow you're going back and you're killing him, thereby removing that necessary condition. So you didn't exist in order to go back and kill him, you know, like, um, so we get this paradox. Now, what David Lewis said is that, like, hold on a second, like, yeah, we definitely have to take Take into account your intrinsic causal powers, but we also have to take into account consistency. Um, we have to take into account more global facts about reality. And yeah, whenever we're doing this time travel, right, time travel is possible only insofar as the intrinsic causal powers are uh, manifested in such a way as not to violate and not to entail contradictions uh, with more global states of affairs uh, in reality. And so what David Lewis said is just that uh, no, you actually could go back in the past. It's just like if you tried to to kill your grandfather, right? Like, you know, you'd either you'd like slip on a banana or something or, <laughs> you know, you wouldn't be able to exercise your powers uh, in such a way, in such circumstances in order to do that precisely because, right? Precisely because it entails a contradiction um, that would not be consistent. And again, I'm not like defending time travel. I'm just saying what David Lewis argued is that, yes, you can have time travel. It's just it has to respect consistency and it has to respect broader facts of reality so as not to engender contradictions. And Schmidt is saying maybe an infinite past is sort of like time travel. You could theoretically go back in time, but reality won't let you create contradictions like shooting your grandfather. Likewise, you could have an infinite past but reality won't let you do things like the paper passer experiment that create contradictions. But the problem here is the situations aren't analogous. So you could use a faulty patchwork principle and say, well, I can shoot my gun in this situation and that situation. Why can't I go back in time and use my intrinsic gun shooting powers to kill my grandfather before my father was ever born? I think you can see this is not like the paper passers whose intrinsic powers are utilized in only slightly varying situations. The difference between passing a paper one year and then the previous year is way less than the difference between shooting a gun after I was born and shooting a gun before I was born. So it's not a good counterexample to show we've messed up assessing whether this alternate world with an infinite past is even possible. So I don't think Trent has fully appreciated the nature of my point, however. My point isn't an appeal to analogy, or even a counterexample to the Patrick principle. Instead, my point is simply as follows. When we patch, or rearrange, or duplicate, and so on, various entities together to construct a world, there are various constraints that have to be met in order for us to be justified in asserting that the resultant constructed world is a possible world. One of these constraints is that we need to have enough space and time in the framework world to be able to quote-unquote fit the various entities we want to patch into the world. This is why, for instance, David Lewis added a proviso on his Patrick principle, space and time permitting. But another constraint that has to be met is that the world can't be contradictory, right? The various entities we patch together can't be incompatible with broader, more global facts or features of reality. Again, it might be more broad, but, you know, screw that, okay? So I say screw it. I'm saying broader because I like it, okay? So anyway, um, this is what the time travel scenario illustrates, right? It illustrates that the various entities that we patch together can't be incompatible with broader, more global facts or features of reality. And that in turn illustrates a constraint that has to be placed on Patrick principles, namely that the patched together world can't be contradictory. And so it's that that the time travel scenario illustrates. The point isn't that the time travel scenario is quote unquote analogous to the Benedetti paradox, or that the time travel scenario is a counterexample to Patrick principles. Instead, the point is simply that the time travel scenario illustrates that the Patrick principles need some, or that the Patrick principle needs some restrictions if we want to infer that the patched up constructed world is a possible world as opposed to an impossible one. And one such restriction, as illustrated by the time travel scenario, is that the world can't be contradictory. The various entities we patch together can't be incompatible with broader, more global facts or features of reality. So it is irrelevant to point out, as Trent did, that there are disanalogies between the time travel and paper passer scenarios. Of course there are. But that isn't germane to my point. 
My point is simply that the time travel scenarios illustrate that Patrick principles need restrictions. And once we add the above mentioned restriction, which debars incompatibility with more global features or facts about reality, we can no longer go from one, an infinite causal chain is possible, to two, a Benedetti paradox is possible. Since the latter involves patching together entities, each of which follows a rule to write its number on the paper if and only if no earlier entity writes its number on the paper, in such a way that is incompatible with more global features or facts about reality. Namely, the fact that the chain in question is arranged in a beginningless manner. For these two, completely in the abstract, with no reference to time or causation or dependence or whatever, strictly entail a contradiction, as philosopher Nicholas Chacal and others have shown. And the two, the two, you know, the two theses or tenets in the unsatisfiable pair are A and B, the A condition and B condition. A, a set, we have a set that is non-well-founded. Okay, that sounds fancy, right? But a well-founded set or series or sequence or whatever, it just has a kind of first element, right? It, along some ordering relation. So like, if we're talking about the set of the days of the week, right? That's a well-founded set because... Well, it starts with Sunday, right? Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, blah, 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 blah. Um, uh, and, and so on, right? Um, and so a set is non-well-founded if it doesn't have such a first member uh, along some kind of relation, ordering relation, that kind of orders the set. Maybe it's earlier than, maybe it's before, maybe it's causes, maybe it's grounds, maybe it's explains, and so on, right? Um, and so we have a set that is non-well-founded. That's just to say that it has no first member or element. In, along some direction, and it has a strict total ordering. The relation to that order is it could be earlier than, or later than, or causes, or is dependent on, or is caused by, uh, or whatever, right? It's a purely abstract relation. There we go. Okay, so, and then, so then B, the B condition, is that for any member M of the set, some property or condition P holds at that member, if and only if that property or condition P holds nowhere before P along the ordering relation. So that's along the direction of non-well-foundedness. So like, in the direction of the beginningless past, say, or in the direction of the endless future, say, if, if, if that's the direction of non-well-foundedness. Uh, so the point to see is simply this. Like, this is the point that I'm getting at. Patchwork principles need restrictions. These restrictions tell us when we can and cannot infer when the patched-up world is a possible world. But one such restriction that disallows the inference to the possibility of the patched-up world is that the various entities to be patched or stitched together would be incompatible with broader, more global facts or features of the resultant world. And yet this is precisely what happens in the case of the inference required for Trent's argument from one, an infinite causal chain is possible, to two, a Benedetti paradox is possible. This is because the entities to be patched together here would be incompatible with the broader, more global facts of the resultant world. And hence the Patrick principle is restricted in a manner that disallows the inference from one to two. And hence, Trent cannot avail himself of the Patrick principle to facilitate the inference from one to two. And yet Trent needs the inference from one to two for his argument to succeed. And so Trent is in a pickle, right? He's in a pickle little little little. Since it seems like he's going to need <laughs> what am I doing, man? Like, I swear, I go insane as I make videos. Uh, and so Trent is in a pickle, right? Since it seems like he's going to need to appeal to the Patrick Principle to go from one to two, but we've just seen that you can't do that. To make things concrete, suppose that I want to take as my framework world one in which the following holds true. A star, there is an essentially omnipotent being who created a vast, empty physical universe and who believes that there are no electrons. Now suppose I want to patch together a world in which A star is true, but also in which I populate the world with an electron. An electron, just like a Grim Reaper, is obviously individually possible, and or a paper passer, I guess I should have put that there, uh, and A star has enough room in space-time to fit an electron. Hence, given the Patrick principle, I should be able to stitch together a world in which A star holds, but in which there is an electron. But oh no, right, we've just arrived at a contradiction. For the being in A star is essentially omniscient, and in that case it cannot have a false belief, but I just stitched together a world in which that being believes that there are no electrons. And yet there is an electron, right? So the problem with this should be obvious. I can't patch an electron, which is individually possible, into a framework world that also has an essentially omniscient being who believes that there are no electrons. For this would be to patch into a world, pat, for this would be to patch into the world an entity which is incompatible with broader, more global facts about reality. Namely, the fact that there is an omniscient being who holds a belief about there being no electrons. 
Thus, although an electron is individually possible, and although there's enough space and time in the framework to accommodate the electron, the resultant patched up world is not possible. The Patrick principle therefore disallows us to infer the possibility of such a world. Indeed, it also disallows us to infer the possibility of such a world, even conditional upon the lone possibility of A star. It would be absurd to suggest that A star is impossible, because we can use the Patrick principle to take us from an A star world to a world in which the conjunction... <laughs> conjunction! <laughs> oh, man. Um... So let me, let me retreat. It would be absurd to suggest that A star is impossible because we can use the Patrick principle to take us from the A star world to a world in which the conjunction of A star and there is an electron holds. Like, that's, that's just absurd. You can't infer the impossibility of A star from that. Um, A star just is obviously possible, right? Obviously, God could create an empty universe. Uh, and this is the exact same thing that's happening in the case of the paper passers. Sure, a paper passer who follows the relevant rule is individually possible, and sure, there's enough space and time in a world with a beginningless past to accommodate infinitely many such paper passers following the, re following the relevant rule stretching into a beginningless past. But the resultant patched up world is not possible, for the same reason as the case of the omniscient being. This would be to patch into a world entities which are incompatible with the broader, more global facts about reality, namely the fact that the past is beginningless. The Patrick Principle therefore disallows us to infer the possibility of such a world. Indeed, just as the case above, it also disallows us to infer the possibility of such a world even conditional upon the lone possibility of a beginningless past. In the case of the omniscient being, we saw that the following conditional claim is false, as the inference captured therein fails. Here's the failed inference number one. If the proposition that A star obtains is possible, then, by the Patrick principle, the joint satisfaction of the proposition that A star obtains and there is an electron is also possible. But no, that, that's just a non sequitur. But by the same token, the following conditional claim is false, as the inference captured therein fails for the exact same reason as above. So here's the failed inference number two. If the proposition that there is a beginningless past is individually possible, then, by the Patrick principle, the joint satisfaction of there is a beginningless past and infinitely many reapers, infinitely many paper passers following the relevant rule are uniformly temporally stretched out over the beginningless past is also possible. That's likewise a non sequitur for the same reason as above. And thus, transfer joinder is not relevant to my criticism, and my criticism stands. Indeed, it is strengthened after considering transfer joinder. Patrick principles also have to respect consistency, right? You can't you can't patch up a world wherein this is an extrinsic feature, so it's 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 not the greatest. But you can't take the fact that someone is the tallest person in the world, right? And uh, in this world, and another possible world where a a, a different person is the tallest possible tallest person in that world, right? And you can't patch them together so as to have them both be in a possible world wherein they're both the tallest people in that world, right? That's just contradictory, right? Um, but these cases are clearly individually possible, and there's clearly, you know, a possible spatiotemporal framework that can fit them together, as it were, but yet we sort of ran into a contradiction when we did that. What we have to do is we have to respect consistency. We have to respect contradiction whenever we're doing our patchwork principles. So, um... Having two tallest people of different heights in the same possible world entails a clear modal contradiction that is not present in the paper passer experiment. So, so I just said here, what? Yes, it is, right? The unsatisfiable pair diagnosis, or UPD, consists of two purely abstract claims. A, a set that is non-well-founded and has a strict total ordering, and B, for any member M of the set property slash condition P holds at M if and only if P holds nowhere before M along the ordering relation. Or, to make things slightly more concrete because it aids in understanding, uh, condition A, the set is beginningless and infinite. For example, uh, negative 6, negative 5, negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1. And again, beginningless. We're not talking only about time. This is just some ordering relation, right? This set could also be beginningless in the sense of if we just place this 0 right here over here and then did negative 1 here, then negative 2, then negative 3, and then negative 4, then negative 5, then dot, dot, dot here, that would also be quote-unquote beginningless in a sense. All we mean is just that the relevant set is non-well-founded in some direction, uh, the direction of some ordering relation. So that's A the A condition, but we're just going to focus on this particular beginningless and infinite set. There's no beginning to this set. This is the set of the negative integers plus zero. Um, and then B, the property P holds at member M for any member M of the infinite set, if and only if P holds nowhere before M in the set, where before refers to the quote unquote earlier members within the ordering relation. So in this case above, right, it would be all the negative numbers below a particular given number. So if we let M be negative three, well then before M would refer to negative four, negative five, negative six, negative seven, and so on, ad infinitum. 
Benedetti paradoxes all share this abstract form. In Trent's paper passer case, A is the beginningless, infinite set of paper passers, and B is the rule implemented by each such reaper to write its number on the paper if and only if no earlier reaper writes its number on the paper. With the purely abstract A and B conditions in hand, we can get a contradiction. Uh, and here's how that goes. Listen, just read this if you're interested, but you <laughs> read this because this gives you a proof, but um, it's just simply true that the purely abstract nature of A and B gives you a logical contradiction of the form P and not P by themselves. They entail it. It's like saying that the cat is on the mat and it's not the case that the cat is on the mat. Um, it's just slightly harder to see it immediately and intuitively, but they do. The, the purely abstract nature of A and B by themselves, alone, together, strictly entail a contradiction. And so I'm not going to go through this derivation. Um, you can see it in the description if you want. Um, but anyway, let's move on to here. Um, so yeah, anyway, we get a contradiction from assuming the conjunction of both A and B. It's just like saying A is taller than B and B is taller than A. It's just like saying both of that in the same breath, right? They're jointly unsatisfiable for purely logical abstract reasons. Okay, fine. I mean, I guess you have to talk about the nature of taller than, but um, uh, we could we could we could talk about some other relation if we wanted. But the point is just that they're jointly unsatisfiable for purely logical reasons. This is saying that A is both taller than B and not taller than B, uh, which is absurd. Uh, in fact, the very abstractness of this contradiction, I say, gives us powerful reason to think causal finitism is not the right solution. For there are paradoxes with an entirely identical structure that causal finitism is utterly impotent to resolve. Consider Yablo, Stephen Yablo, the philosopher, consider Stephen Yablo's semantic paradox. A. Consider an infinite set of ordered sentences, each of which is labeled with a unique natural number. So, sentence S1, sentence S2, sentence S3, and so on. B condition. Now suppose that for any natural number n, s sub n is true if and only if none of the s sub m are true, where m is a natural number greater than n. So basically we're just saying that um, pick any natural number you like. Um, the sentence that has that natural number, that's going to be true if and only if none of the sentences with greater natural numbers are true. Okay, so like if we pick, if we let n be 2, well then we're saying that s 2 is true, if and only if none of S3, S4, S5, S6, and so on are true, okay? And now, notice that these are exactly the same A and B conditions as before, right? In A, we have a non-well-founded infinite set, and in B, we have of each member in the set. We had true, okay, excuse me, I'm just going to put true here, all right? Oh, crap. <laughs> true of, there we go. So in A, we have a non-well-founded infinite set, and in B, we have true of each member in the set, that the member has some property, if and only if no member in the direction of non-well-foundedness has that property. So here's the derivation of the contradiction. Suppose that some sentence in this set is true. Call it S sub V. Now, if S sub V is true, well, then it follows that none of the sentences with a greater, with a number greater than V are true. But if none of those sentences are true, well, then clearly none of the sentences with the number greater than V plus one are true. But in that case, S sub V plus 1 is itself true, right? Since, per the condition, any sentence in the set is true if none of the greater numbered sentences are true. And so in that case, S sub V isn't true after all, since there's a greater numbered sentence, namely S sub V plus 1, as we just showed, that is true. And by B, right, by condition B, S sub V could only be true if no greater numbered sentence is true. And thus, by assuming that some sentence in the set is true, we derived a contradiction. That contradiction is that S sub V is both true and not true, and therefore no sentence in this set is true. But if no sentence in this set is true, well then obviously no sentence with a number greater than 1 is true, right? And in that case, right, S sub 1 is true, <laughs> because if no number greater than, if, if none of the sentences with a number greater than a given sentence and their number is true, well then it just follows that that sentence is true, right? That follows from the B condition. And so there is a sentence in the set that's true. And that's a contradiction, right? We concluded from here that there's no true sentence in the set. And we just deduced that if that's the case, well, then there actually is, in fact, a true sentence in the set. And so we've landed in a strict contradiction. And notice that nothing here has anything to do with causation or time or whatever, right? And so causal finitism is utterly impotent to resolve this paradox. So we need some other solution. But notice, right, this is crucial. Notice that this paradox has an identical structure to the Benedetti paradoxes, including the paper passer paradox. All you do is swap out paper passer for sentence and writes its number on its paper for is true, right? Here's the paper passer A condition. 
there is a non-well-founded sequence of infinitely many paper passers. Here is the semantic, a condition for Yablo's paradox. There is a non-well-founded sequence of infinitely many sentences, right? So you're just replacing the red for the blue. And now here's the paper passer B condition. For each paper passer, it writes a number on the paper, if and only if no other paper passer in the direction of non-well-foundedness writes its number on that paper. And then now look at the semantic B condition, right, for Yablo's paradox. For each sentence, it is true if and only if no other sentence in the direction of non-well-foundedness is true. Again, you're just replacing the red for the blue. And again, this is this just goes back to the purely abstract structure. You can plug in whatever you want here. Um, and so this gives us, I think, extremely strong reason to think that these paradoxes should have the same solution. Since causal finitism cannot be the correct solution to the semantic paradox, it follows that we have extremely strong reason to think that causal finitism cannot be the correct solution to the paper passer paradox either. But my main point is the same kind of contradiction is not identifiable in the paper passer or Hilbert's Hotel, uh, or these other examples. In these other examples that are brought up, you can point out the specific reason why the paradox can't happen beyond just the existence of a certain kind of world. But that's not the case with the paper passers or Hilbert's Hotel, where it is the infinite past itself that gives rise to normal activities taking on a paradoxical nature. But this is not true, right? It's not the beginningless past itself. It's the conjunction or joint satisfaction of conditions A and B as shown above. And the mere fact of there being a beginningless past doesn't entail the possibility of their joint satisfaction. That's why we need something like a Patrick principle, as Coons, for instance, in his paper seems to recognize, his 2014 paper published in News. And yet we've already seen why appeal to a Patrick principle won't help. Now, as an aside, uh, Hilbert's Hotel isn't contradictory. There's no contradiction there. So I just wanted to point that out as an aside. And also another aside, um, the exact same reasoning Trent gives rules out an endless future, since an endless future also equally facilitates the construction of future-oriented Benedetti paradoxes just from rearranging and duplicating the ordinary humdrum activities of things. See the Kalam section of my previous video responding to Trent Horn. Uh, my previous video, that's the one where, uh, the one I published really recently uh, on, uh, published, the one that, that I uploaded really recently uh, on his debate with Ben Watkins at CCV1 conference. So all you need is that all you need is the exact same reapers with the exact same activities, plus a god with foreknowledge, the latter of which Trent already believes in. So um, now Trent goes on to discuss the eternal society paradox, but that's that's just another Benedetti paradox and suffers from the same problems as the paper passer paradox, namely one, symmetrical future oriented paradoxes, two, the non sequitur from the possibility of a beginningless past to the possibility of the joint satisfaction of conditions A and B, three, reliance on a deeply implausible Patrick principle or principles, which ironically stem from a Humean or neo Humean picture of the world as devoid of necessary connections among distinct existences, or at least devoid of necessary connections among the intrinsic characters of distinct existences. This is just distinct things, by the way. Um, that's Hume's phrase for distinct things, um, uh, uh, which is fundamentally at odds, right? This kind of human or neo-human picture of the world is fundamentally at odds with highly anti-human metaphysical views like Aristotelianism. So that's uh, yet a third problem. Fourth problem, the UPD. Fifth problem, an Aristotelian or branching theory of modality that I point out in my response uh, to, to Trent Horn, uh, that, that Trent Horn is currently responding to, and so on, right? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And here's a final aside. If you see value in my work, consider becoming a patron, right? There, patron, there is a link in the description and much love, so much love to all my existing patrons. You guys unironically are helping me pay my college debt, <laughs> my student debt, right? Your patron, uh, your, your, your patron donations and whatnot, they're helping me get through college unironically, uh, which is a stepping stone to going to grad school and getting a PhD in philosophy and continuing to write books and articles and hopefully continuing to serve people through this YouTube channel and so on, right? So all of this is in, you know, all of this is for service, right? It's to serve people. It's to help them think critically about the fundamental nature of reality, about questions that matter, like God's existence, like whether or not there can be paper passers that, that <laughs> write their number on papers. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, if you see value in my work and if you see the charity and caution and rigor of argumentation and uh, uh, well-researched aspects of my videos, if you see value in that, if you enjoy my videos, if, if you think they're funny at occasion, you know, when I do like a Jesus compression or whatever, uh, consider becoming a patron or perhaps just a one-time donation, right? Um, I, I have a link in the description. It's uh, my PayPal, I think. And you could just, you know, maybe just two bucks, right? That, that could uh, buy a coffee or something. Um, think of it like me putting my 
hat out at the end of a performance and, you know, people just, you know, putting a little tip in that. Or think of it like me playing at the side of the street, right? Playing some music there. Um, people go and just put maybe two bucks or maybe five bucks just in the, in the, in the case of the guitar, say, or the, the violin. Uh, so think of it like that, right? It's kind of like a violin performance when I'm doing these sorts of videos, right? I, I don't get money from this. I do this for free. I make my videos. Um, I, I don't monetize this, this channel, peeps, uh, because I myself, hate ads. I mean, I have an ad blocker, but, <laughs> but I myself hate ads, right? I hate ads. I hate listening to that. And so because I'm putting audience first, because I care about you guys, I'm not putting you guys through that. I could monetize my channel, but I'm not going to, right? Because I don't like ads and I don't want you guys to experience ads. Think of like, you're, you're trying to listen to this philosophy video that's a few hours long in like every 10 minutes it's interrupted by an ad. That would be so annoying. Um, so anyway, I care about you guys, and I care about you getting the, the best experience of watching my YouTube videos, and that's why I'm not monetizing my videos. And so anyway, if you see value in the work that I do in my um, my kind of, my ethic, my philosophy, as it were, um, uh, and my style, and my not monetizing things, consider supporting me. And if you want to help me get through college, uh, consider supporting me on, on Patreon or, or one-time donation. So thank you. Um, anyway, that's, that's my little, uh, what, my little shill speech? Is that what I should call it? No. Um, but anyway... I'm not a shill. I'm just trying to serve people, really. So uh, let's move on to what Trent says here. The second problem for the Patrick Principle is just that it seems to be flatly inconsistent with theism. Why is that? Well, and not only not only is it inconsistent with theism, uh, but it's inconsistent with you know the very argument that he's proposing here, uh, the very PSR that he's that he's using, right? Because if we're using a kind of unrestricted Patrick principle that doesn't respect more global features of reality, right? Well, then we could just patch up a world. We could take a, a possible world with a spatio-temporal framework uh, large enough to accommodate, you know, uh, uh, a bunch of a bunch of suffering people, and then we can take isolated incidents of people experiencing horrendous evils and just being like tortured, and we can we can sort of uh, take those and patch them up into this spatio-temporal framework and thereby dupl and duplicate them and thereby create a possible world where it's pretty much nothing but intense, horrendous suffering for basically the the eternity of the world. That would follow from the patchwork principle. There would be a possible world where we could patch up things in such a manner where it's just nothing but this horrendous evil and torture and things like that just for the entire world maybe uh for like a, a bajillion years or something whatever uh, and with like a bajillion humans just being tortured like the whole time that clearly is not compatible with a with it with god's existence with a perfect being existing right i mean just imagine if that world were actual, right? I mean, like, I think that that world would be incompatible with God's existence, right? Because by our Patrick principle, uh, we are patching up a world wherein no goods even obtain in virtue of of these things. Um, and so uh, it seems to me that uh, Patrick principles, we're, we're going to be able to patch up a world wherein basically horrendous evils predominate. And there aren't sufficiently good reasons for allowing them to obtain. And from that, it would follow that in that possible world, God doesn't exist because any perfect being definitely would not allow that world to obtain. And hence, we get that possibly God doesn't exist, and by the S5 axiom of modal logic, we get that God actually doesn't exist, right? Now, the response, the response that, that Trent should give, and rightly, I think he, he's well within his epistemic rights to give. This is sort of the response I would give, but it's missing some crucial details. Is that, well, hold on a second, right? Like, no, you can't do that patch because you have to respect more, you have to respect, like, broader facts of reality, namely God's existence and God's uh, nature and character as all loving. Like, he just wouldn't allow that, right? Uh, and so, uh, merely from the fact that you have enough room, you have, like, this sort of spatio-temporal framework, and merely from the fact that you have these isolated incidents with their sort of causal powers that you can patch in there and duplicate in this world, it does not follow that that would be a possible world because it has to respect these more these these broader wider uh wide scale facts namely god's existence and his character and uh his providential governance over creation but now once he uses that response right now the defender of infinite causal chains can use that response right the the, inf the defender of infinite causal chains is like whoa 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 hold on a second right like <laughs> we have to respect broader like global is it more broad it's probably more broad who cares we have to respect uh, broader, more global considerations of consistency. Um, and that's precisely what you're not doing when you're using the, the Patrick principle. And again, you know, there, there's definitely room for, for discussion and, and further uh, inquiry here. But my point is just that there's no simple, easy path from 
the, the, the possibility of infinite causal chains using the Patrick principle to get this sort of construct this sort of paradoxical scenario that doesn't also pose problems for, for theism and actually, interestingly, poses problems for a lot of things that Trent is saying in this debate, in this discussion, right? Because Schmidt's possible world example doesn't follow because I would say that any instance of evil God permits has a corresponding good reason associated with permitting it. So this is irrelevant to my objection. My objection didn't assume that there is even one instance of evil which is such that there is no corresponding good reason for which God permits it. My objection instead is that given the Patrick principle, there are no necessary connections among distinct things, or at least among the intrinsic characters of distinct things. To quote Rob Coons, quoting David Lewis in a PowerPoint presentation, Quote, here I rely on a Patrick principle for possibility. If it is possible that X happen intrinsically in a spatiotemporal region, and if it is likewise possible that Y happen in a region, then, it, then also it is possible that both X and Y happen in two distinct but adjacent regions. There are no necessary incompatibilities between distinct existences. Anything can follow anything. By the Patrick principle's own lights, there are no such necessary connections among the intrinsic characters of distinct things. But theism has to deny this, precisely because there is a necessary connection between the intrinsic character of God, namely the fact that he is essentially morally perfect and hence must have a good reason for the evil he permits, and the obtaining of some evil state of affairs. And this in turn means that every evil state of affairs is essentially connected with some outweighing good state of affairs. But then the Patrick principle is simply false, for then there are necessary connections among the intrinsic characters of distinct existences, or what goes on in distinct space-time regions. The whole point of my objection is that God does indeed have reasons for allowing evil, right? Trent is simply agreeing with me there. But Trent has failed to see why this spells disaster for the Patrick principles, or principle, since this entails that there are necessary connections among the intrinsic characters of distinct things, such as evil states of affairs on the one hand and their corresponding outweighing good states of affairs on the other. Uh, even if we can't determine what that good reason specifically is. Therefore, there is not even one instance of unjustifiable evil in the world to patch into some scenario where there is nothing but unjustifiable evils. So Trent here has misunderstood my criticism. And of course, when misunderstanding happens, right, you can't you can't automatically blame the person who misunderstands it. It could be due to the unclarity and imprecision of the person who made the original point. Right. So I'm not I'm not blaming Trent for this here. Right. So. Um, uh, yeah, anyway, but the point remains, right? It's still true that he's misunderstood my criticism, right? Nowhere did I say that there is one unjustifiable evil in the actual world that we can patch into a separate world where we then have a bunch of unjustified evils. Instead, my point is that we can take a horrendously evil state of affairs that is individually possible, and, per the Patrick principle, we can patch together a world containing nothing but these horrendous evils, without any outweighing goods that accrue from them in the resultant patched-up world. This simply follows from the Patrick principle, which allows us to take individual possibilities and their intrinsic characters, and then populate worlds in, in whatever manner we please, so long as there is enough time and space to fit what we patch in. This is part and parcel of the Patrick principle's denial of necessary connections among the intrinsic characters of distinct things, for example, distinct states of affairs. So, while Trent has characterized me as stating... As, excuse me. So while Trent has characterized me as starting with an unjustifiable evil and duplicating it to get a world in which there are tons of unjustifiable, unjustifiable evils, this is simply a misrepresentation. Instead, I'm simply taking a horrendous evil from our world, even if actually justified in our world, and using the Patrick principle to stitch together a world in which that horrendous evil obtains, but its outweighing good doesn't obtain, in which case it wouldn't be justified in the resultant patched up world. And we can indeed do this, because it follows from the Patrick Principle. I agree that that's not compatible with theism. That's my point, right? So let's go on to Trent's next clip. No, I'm not saying there aren't horrendous evils. There are horrendous evils. Marilyn McCord Adams has a book called Horrendous Evils and the Goodness of God. Uh, my point is that God doesn't allow any evil to exist that simply lacks a corresponding good reason for allowing that evil. Once again, even if we don't know what the good reason is. So it's not the fact that there is an overarching principle that prevents applying instances of horrendous evils across an infinite world. It's the fact that the isolated example of a terrible evil that has no good reason for its existence, that's not even possible in its own right. So you can't make an infinite amount of them. 
This would be like me saying an infinite past is impossible because I can imagine an infinite number of paper passers transmitting a four-sided triangle across an infinite past, and that can't happen. But the best paradoxes against an infinite past, they involve local conditions that are not controversial and whose gradual extension into the infinite past show it is the temporal duration that is the problem, not whatever the task is that is involved in the paradox. So, once again, Trent has simply misunderstood my criticism. I'm not saying that an unjustifiable evil is individually possible. All my argument requires is that the evil is individually possible. Given the Patrick principle, it simply follows that we can duplicate this evil and arrange together a world in which there is nothing but repeated instances of this evil, and thus a world in which there is no outweighing good and hence no reason God has for allowing evil. And that would, that would indeed be possible as a result of this, by dint of the Patrick principle. To be sure, I don't think this argument is a good argument against God's existence, right? That's because the Patrick principle is just false. <laughs> uh, all I'm arguing is that the Patrick principle is incompatible with theism. Uh, now, you might be thinking, but you can't patch together that world, right? Because the evil in question is necessarily connected with some outweighing good. Uh, yes, yes, that's the whole point, right? The whole point is that under theism, there are necessary connections among distinct existences. And hence, the Patrick principle, which relies on a denial of that, is false. Uh, he's trying to use the, the PSR, and if we can use this Patrick principle, well, then we can actually just uh, patch up a world where something spontaneously pops into existence. Uh, because, you know, things do come into existence in our world, so we can just take uh, the fact of it's coming into existence, uh, and we can take that as our sort of isolated patch, we can, we can ignore its cause, and we can just patch that into a different world, uh, and then that thing would thereby begin to be without any, without any extrinsic cause causing it to begin to be, and hence we would have a violation of the PSR, which he's arguing is necessarily true, and hence these Patrick principles are incompatible even with the very arguments that he's, that he's using for God's existence, right? We can't merely we can't patch up worlds like this in such in such a simple manner, right? We have to respect we have to respect the PSR. We have to respect more global facts about reality. We have to respect consistency. Yeah, there are just lots of lots of big problems for Patrick principles. Yeah, just in my estimation, at least. Uh, I would say there is no world where things can just pop into existence for no reason at all. <laughs> we have another case where I was angry when I wrote this. Uh, so I said, "Bruh, like that's the whole point, right? The whole point is that this isn't possible." And yet, if the Patrick Principle is true, this would be possible. Hence, the Patrick Principle is false. The reason its possibility follows from the Patrick Principle is that something's coming into being is an isolated possibility. And hence, we can patch this isolated possibility into a world without patching into the world anything that could serve as the cause of its coming into being. Once again, you might object, ah, but you can't patch up that world, right? Because can coming into being is necessarily connected with some cause. And I agree, but that's the whole point, right? The whole point is that there are necessary connections among distinct existences. I should emphasize that. The whole point is that there are necessary connections among distinct existences. And hence, the Patrick Principle, which relies on a denial of that, is false. As a result, you can't even get the first patch started in such a patchwork principle-based system. Once again, Trent has misunderstood the criticism. The point isn't that we take an isolated case where something comes into being without a cause and then patch that into a world. Rather, the isolated possibility we consider is simply something's coming into being. And this happens all the time, and hence it is obviously possible. It is then by means of the Patrick Principle that we get to a world in which this happens without a cause. Since that's absurd, it follows that the Patrick Principle is false. Uh, so that's definitely the major problem with uh, his appeal here to the uh, the paper passer paradox. And actually, there is a uh, a second problem here, um, and it derives from the branching theory of modality. So in short, uh, according to a branching or Aristotelian theory of modality, um, possibilities uh, are necessarily derivative from actualities. That is to say, anything is possible in virtue of either being actual in the actual world or being some potential branch that can branch off from our world by means of the causal powers of actual things, right? And so, uh, according to this theory of modality, it's very Aristotelian. Broadly speaking, it's what Graham Oppie holds, it's what Alexander Proust holds. Uh, Rob Coons is, is sympathetic to a kind of branching theory of modality, because it's, it's very Aristotelian, and I think it's, I think it's rather plausible. Um, I, you know, I obviously need to study modal metaphysics more in order to have a, you know, a considered view, but it seems plausible. 
But what the branching theory of modality entails is that um, there is a there is some initial world segment, whether it be finite or infinite. Um, there is some initial world segment that all possible worlds share, and they 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 have to share it. So there is some necessary initial segment of worlds. Uh, why is that? Well, because uh, as we saw, right, the branching theory of modality entails that. Possible worlds are only possible in virtue of being branches off from the actual world, right? It's the sort of uh, causal powers of actual things that uh, branch off in these different directions. And long story short, it's actually um, somewhat of a complicated deduction, but um, you know, it's basically widely recognized that you essentially get uh, a necessary being for free from this branching theory of modality as long as you accept some other uh, highly plausible um, uh, principles. Uh, and so you get this sort of necessary initial segment of reality um, that all worlds share and they branch off of, as it were, uh, from a sort of causal powers-based account. Um, and it's precisely because everything is sort of rooted in the actual world, right? All possibilities are rooted in the actu in actuality and actual causal powers that all possible worlds sort of share this initial world segment, right? All things can only be possible in virtue of diverging from the actual world. And hence, you know, there's this sort of initial segment that that all worlds are going to be sharing. You kind of you get this sort of necessary initial segment for free under this uh, branching theory of modality. And Oppy, I believe both he and Kuhn's talked about this in our uh, in our discussion uh, on my channel. I, I think it's called From Necessary Being to God. So definitely check that out for for more details. Uh, and check out Proust's book uh, Actuality, Possibility, and Worlds for more details as well. So a quick note: uh, listening back to what I say here, I should have been more precise. Uh, what follows from the Aristotelian or branching theorem modality is that each possible world shares an initial segment with our world, whether that initial segment is infinitely long, finitely long, or perhaps even timeless. What doesn't follow from the Aristotelian or branching theory of modality is that there is some single initial segment in our world that ev each and every other possible world shares. Uh, I really should have clarified this in my original video. Uh, ultimately, though, it doesn't matter to the argument I develop, since my argument goes through either way, right? What matters is simply that there can be no possible world under an Aristotelian or under an Aristotelian or branching theory of modality that doesn't share some initial segment with our actual world. That just follows from the Aristotelian or branching theory of modality. Uh, if that's true, well then, because no initial segment of our world contains a metadata paradox, even if it's past infinite, even if our world is past infinite, it follows that no possible world contains, and even can contain, a Benedetti paradox. And, hence, one cannot infer from an infinite past to the possibility of a Benedetti paradox, if an Aristotelian or branching theory modality is true. Trent suggests that a dialogue on this objection would probably be most fitting, and I agree with him here. Uh, I mean, I'm using, for instance, a technical sense of initial world segment, as used in the literature and the metaphysics of modality, which unfortunately I didn't define in the original video. I should have defined it, to be sure. And so if I could go back and slap myself, I would. Uh, this becomes problematic, because in what Trent says in response to the branching theory of modality objection, uh, an objection Oppie, for instance, raises in one of his published book reviews, um, Trent doesn't use the notion as I use the notion. Um, for example, he says that there is no initial segment if the past is infinite, but, and Trent isn't to be faulted for this since I didn't define my terms, uh, that's not true, right? An initial world segment relative to branching off point P is everything causally and, as the case may be, temporally prior to P. Uh, now, this might be a finite segment, but it also might be infinite. Uh, because of all this, I'm going to table this stuff about branching theories of modality uh, and reserve it for when slash if Trent and I have a dialogue. Uh, for this reason, I'm, I, I'll, I won't respond to what Trent says in the next minute or two of his video on the branching theory objection. Uh, he's working with a, de with a definition that differs from mine, uh, and so his criticisms are off the mark for that reason. Uh, that's my fault. Not his, right? I didn't define initial world segment in my video. So I'm not blaming Trent here, I'm blaming myself. Like I said, if I could go back and slap myself, I would. And then finally, um, he... He tried to say, like, because you can't have uh, this infinite causal chain, right, you can't have infinitely many events before, uh, or infinitely many events causally impinging on one another, and hence time must be uh, finite in the past. It just doesn't follow. That's just a, a non sequitur, right? Even granting causal finitism, um, there's a, a clear quantifier shift fallacy here, right? Because, right, merely from the fact that for each causal chain, it has a first member, uh, it does not follow that there is a first member for all causal chains in reality. Uh, it just doesn't follow, like from the fact that for all x there exists a y, it, it does not entail that does not entail that there exists a y such that for all x the thing is true, right? So consider, for instance, for every human there exists a mother, right? So for all x such that x is a human, there exists a y such that y is a mother of that human, right? But that does not entail clearly that there is some one mother. Which is the mother of like all human, all humanity, right? Like mother humanity that, that gave birth to all of us. Like no, that's what the second, that's what the second thing in here uh, says. There exists a Y. That is to say, there exists some singular mother, which is such that it is the mother for all X, which is all humanity, right? Um, and so it clearly doesn't follow. Likewise, it doesn't follow from the fact that each 
causal chain is such that it has a first member does not follow that there is a first member uh, for all causal chains or for, for every causal chain. And so you can't automatically infer the finitude of the past from causal finitism uh, because, again, uh, you could have finite causal chains such that each of them is finite, right? But they're sort of, um, I guess, overlapping within the world in such a way uh, so as to, you know, I extend infinitely far into the past. So you'll recall we dealt with quantifier shifts in our discussion of Aquinas. And I would say the argument from causal finitism does not commit this kind of fallacy either. I am not saying every causal chain has a first member, and so there is a first member that has every causal chain. Instead, the purpose of these thought experiments is to show that infinite causal chains are impossible, period. You can't get around this by saying, well, maybe every individual causal chain is finite, but they are all connected together, and so this creates one infinite causal chain, even though they're all finite. No, this would be an infinite causal chain. And if such chains, infinite chains cannot obtain for whatever reason, then they can't be proposed for any explanations. But that's not at all what I said, right? I didn't say they all link together to form an infinite causal chain. I didn't say that at all, which uh, you can see that I was angry here. Um, but it, it's true. This is another misrepresentation. At this point in the video, I explicitly said I was addressing trends inference from causal finitism to the finitude of the past. Here is why this is a non sequitur. Imagine a situation where, wherein there are infinitely many finite causal chains that temporally overlap, extending into the infinite past. In this case, causal finitism is true, right? Every causal chain is finite. And yet the past isn't finite, uh, since each finite causal chain is temporally overlapping in a way uh, that there are infinitely, in such a way that there are infinitely many of them stretching back into the infinite past. So here's a visualization. Here's time. Here's today. Stretching back into the past. This goes ad infinitum. Uh, and these are causal chains. So here's an effect. Here's a cause. Well, cause of this effect. Effect of this cause. And so th this is a causal chain. Here we have every causal chain being finite, right? Just imagine that we either have two or three nodes, or I guess this is three or four nodes. Imagine that we just have three or four nodes in each causal chain, in which case each causal chain is finite. But look, they're temporally overlapping one another and stretching back in an, into an infinite past. And since you can repeat this, um, like just repeat this schema here, um, the, the possibility or the impossibility of infinite causal chains doesn't entail the impossibility of an infinite past. And because here, each causal chain has a first member, but it's false that there is a first member for all chains. And here, causal finitism is true, but the past is not finite, and hence causal finitism doesn't entail the finitude of the past. But Trent claimed it did, and hence Trent is wrong. Oh, when I say Trent claimed it did, I mean he claimed in his opening statement with Alex. That's what I'm referring to. But let's move on to his clip. So the argument I'm making is really one of mutual exclusivity. Once again, I'm not saying every chain has a first member, so there is a first member that has every chain. Instead, causal chains either have a first member or they do not have a first member. If it is impossible for them to not have a first member, then it logically follows that every causal chain has a first member. And this would include the conjunction of all causal chains in the entire universe. But this is irrelevant to my point. In the video, I was addressing Trent's claim that causal finitism implies that the past is finite. It doesn't. Trent hasn't done anything to bridge this inferential gap. Like, uh, suppose that each causal chain lasts for three seconds, and then just sort of uh, uh, imagine that one causal chain comes to be uh, at the second second, <laughs> at the second second for each causal chain, right? So what, what you get is um, you get three seconds going by, so one second, and then two seconds, and then the next one would start up, um, and so one second, two second, three seconds, and then that one would, would sort of peter out, and then the other one would start up when that the this causal chain hit the second one, and so on, right? And so what you get is that each causal chain in this world is finite, but yet it has an infinite past. It doesn't it doesn't have any infinite causal chains, right? Each causal chain is finite, but yet it still has an infinite past, and nothing that Trent says rules this out uh, in any manner. And hence, his inference to the finitude of the past uh, does not succeed. Um, and of course, that would rely on causal, fi you know, it, it already relied on causal finitism, and his paper passer paradox did not establish causal finitism, as we saw you know, with the, the Patrick principles and the branching theory of modality. But also, it's just the quantifier shift. So it's like three distinct uh, problems in there, and there are lots of sub-problems that I was articulating. I'm not moved by this counterexample because Schmidt is now saying he can imagine finite causal chains that come into existence apparently ex nihilo, and so they, in some kind of de facto way, form an infinite causal chain, 
even though there doesn't seem to be anything that connects each of the chains with one another, except for some undefined principle in his illustration. So I would just say what he's proposing here is not metaphysically possible. And if it's not metaphysically possible, it's not a good counterexample. So nothing I said requires anything to come to be ex nihilo. We can suppose that each of the uncaused first nodes... I don't know why it says notes. <laughs> we can suppose that each of the uncaused first nodes in the picture above are not such that they come into being uncaused, but instead that they are, that they are eternally inactive, but then spontaneously at various points initiate the respective causal chains. Again, the point isn't whether or not this is true or possible. The point is simply that the inference that Trent's making from causal finitism to a finite past needs to rule this scenario out, and it does nothing to rule it out. Um, and there's nothing obviously incoherent uh, about, like, conceptually confused or incoherent about this scenario. And Trent's inference would need to rule it out in order to succeed, but Trent's inference doesn't rule it out, and hence Trent's inference doesn't succeed. That's the structure of the argument. But again, um, instead they're eternally, so it's not as though something's coming to being ex nihilo. In particular, the uncaused first nodes aren't coming into being uncaused. Instead, they might simply be eternally inactive, but then spontaneously at various points initiate the respective causal chains. Nothing here requires things to come into being ex nihilo, or to come into being without a cause. And so Trent's point about metaphysical possibility fails. So let's move on to the gap problem and what Trent says next. We didn't conclude successfully to a purely actual being, but ignoring that. Is it temporal? Well, I mean, he said that time is the measure of change. First of all, this account of time is arguably false. Um, it's, it's not quite clear what time as the measure of change means, right? I mean, there are countless different ways to measure change, right? Many of which are entirely tangential to time. Uh, like, you can measure the quantity of changes that occur, right? Their magnitude, uh, their quality, their probability, you know, their spatial extent, and so on, right? These ways of measuring change are, seem entirely irrelevant to time. In order to avoid this predicament, right, uh, it seems that we have to specify that time is the measure of change qua its temporal dimension, or temporal extent, or temporal succession, rather than, say, along the dimension of temperature or probability. In other words, it seems we must specify, in some form or other, right, that the measure is one of temporal duration. But now the analysis of time is just circular, right? The proposed analysis presupposes the very thing in need of explication, namely time itself. In analyzing time in terms of the measurement of change qua its temporal dimension or extent, right, we've employed uh, the very thing uh, requiring analysis or requiring explication. Change is the essential feature of temporality. For example, I can look at a painting and measure its spatial coordinates, its color hues, but I can't measure any change if I'm only examining the painting in a single moment of time. Now, Schmidt tried to say, well, you have to specify and say time is a measure of change in the temporal duration. But he even notes that this ends up begging the question. It turns the definition of time into the measurement of time. The term is being defined in its own definition. It seems like he's trying to say you can measure a lot of changes that are not directly related to time. Well, yeah, but all those changes can only be known across temporal intervals. It was X at one point in time, and now it's Y at another point of time. You can measure things in static entities, but you can't measure how they've changed without time. So, correct. I didn't deny that change can only happen over time, and I didn't deny that the two are essentially linked. My point, which Trent didn't address, was that analyzing time as a measure of change arguably doesn't work, since the only plausible way of precisifying this sim since the only plausible way of precisifying this, this is spelled correctly. Screw you, autocorrect. Uh, okay, so since the only plausible way of precisifying this simply ends up in a circle, right? It ends up merely presupposing time, in which case we don't actually have a definition or analysis of time after all. And yet Trent's case relied on this purported definition. That is the point, and it's a point Trent doesn't address in this clip. There could be no time if nothing changed. Schmidt does offer his own example against the view that time involves change. So I only argued against a view of time defined as a measure of change. It's a separate question whether time involves change. I wholly agree that the passage of time requires changes, but this is different from saying that time is defined as the measure of change by saying, well, if God made only one instant of time, then you could have time without change. But I'm skeptical that such a world is even possible. It sounds like half the definition of God's eternity. The, the medieval philosopher Boethius defined God's eternity, 
which is timeless, as the whole simultaneous and perfect possession of boundless life. Saying you can have time without change in an instant seems on par with saying you can have three-dimensional space without height, width, or depth. It's, it's contradictory. You could have a timeless instant where God possesses, perfectly possesses his entire life simultaneously, but you can't have an instant of genuine time without any change at all. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be time. So I think Trent is appealing to intuitions here, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, but I must confess that I don't share his intuition. So we seem to be at an impasse. I don't have any intuition that there couldn't be a world in which there is a single instant of time, especially if a timeless God exists, timeless omnipotent God exists. Intuitively, I mean, the opposite seems to be the case. It seems to me that God could easily just grant being to an instant, a temporal instant of reality, say the first instant or moment of the Big Bang, but then simply withdraw his sustaining activity thereafter. Um, that does, there doesn't seem to be, to me, anything problematic about that. Um, but again, we have a conflict of intuitions here, and we thus seem to have an impasse. Um, and so I think we can probably probably move on. I mean, it is important to note that the, the onus of justification in this dialectical context is on Trent. And so um, an impasse actually hurts Trent and, and supports my case, because all I need to do is show that his case doesn't succeed in demonstrating what he wants it to. And so an impasse succeeds in, in, <laughs> succeeds in my endeavor there. But um, let's just move on to uh, one final criticism of this, of this step, that uh, the being in question is uh, timeless. And well, apart from the different Morian problems that we might level against that, the different arguments against timelessness, you know, from um, changing knowledge of, of changing temporal actualities and so on. Um, again, just see my last, my recent video, uh, Why Am I an Agnostic, for uh, just a very brief explication of that. You can also see my discussion with Ryan Mullins. I think it's called Classical Theism and the Problem of Extrinsic Change, I think. I think that's what it's called for an explication and defense of that line of reasoning. This is the idea that if conditions in the world change due to temporal becoming, then God's knowledge must also change as new things come into existence. What's interesting is this argument, it seems to be rooted in Schmidt's views as a presentist when it comes to time. This is a theory of time which says only the present moment exists. And so if the present undergoes temporal change, then God's knowledge of what constitutes the present moment would also change, but the classical view says God doesn't change. In response, I would say this argument, well, it has no force against classical theists who believe in the B theory of time, or that the past, present, and future are all equally real. Under this view, all temporal truths can be rewritten as timeless truths that don't change. So Trent is absolutely right here. Uh, the argument has no force against B-theorist classical theists. Uh, indeed, if I were a classical theist, I would be an unapologetic, unabashed B-theorist. I should note for the audience that I'm a very lukewarm presentist. I lean towards it because I think it's the best, ex well, this is one reason, uh, because I think it's the best explanation for our phenomenological experience of temporal becoming. That is to say, um, that is to say, uh, we, we sort of experience, we, we seem to have this ineliminable, like, just fundamental experience of the dynamism in reality, of things coming to be, going out of existence, just, we seem to progress through time, as it were. There seems to be some kind of dynamism there. That seems so powerful to my, to my senses. I, my, just my, phenomenologically speaking, uh, consciously. Um, yeah, so anyway, it seems to me that the best and perhaps only way to account for that um, is by, by presentism. Now, that's, of course, controversial, but, um, and that's what temporal becoming is. It's just kind of things genuinely coming to be, this kind of genuine dynamism in reality. Um, uh, uh, mind-independent dynamism. Um, but I'm, I'm quite tentative here, importantly, though, uh, since I have some sympathies with truth-maker or truth supervenes on being, uh, as the case may be, objections to presentism. So I do have some sympathies there. Uh, and I also recognize that there is potential conflict with relativity theory and the frame of reference dependence of simultaneity relations. So um, you could call me uh, a very lukewarm, very tentative presentist. Um, but please don't call me a presentist. <laughs> I will note, though, that arguably some serious problems accrue to the classical theist who adopts B-theory, ranging from the problem of evil to creation ex nihilo. You can see my video with Dr. Ryan Mullins, Theism and Eternalism, Friends or Enemies, where we spell out the problems that will result from this, arguably. On to the next clip. Also, even if presentism were true, God could still know truths about the present moment without undergoing change in his own nature, by having some other relation to temporal events beyond merely perceiving them. In any case, Schmidt doesn't 
he doesn't elaborate on the objection, so I won't either, but it'd be definitely a great topic for a future video or future episode. So I won't expand further here. Uh, I will note, though, that even if God merely changes in his extrinsic relations to the temporal facts, this will still temporalize God, since God would still go from standing in a relation to a temporal fact, for example, some knowing relation, to not standing in that relation. So there's still this kind of God going from being one way, namely standing in some relation, to being another way. Uh, and that's that suffices for temporality. So on to the next clip. But, like, even granting this account of time... The original argument from, you know, the Aristotelian account of time to the timelessness of the purely actual being, that would still fail. I mean, merely from the fact that um, time is a measure of change, such that if there's time, then there's change, right? It doesn't follow that whatever is temporal is subject to change, right? Uh, that consequence simply does not follow from the antecedent, right? The antecedent only says that the existence of time entails that there is some change or other, right? It does not say that everything that exists in time must be such that it changes. Uh, for all the argument shows, right, temporal reality could be such that, you know, objects O1 through ON exist in time, but one of those things is unchangeable, uh, and yet time nevertheless exists and passes in virtue of the changes in objects other than that thing in question. Um, uh, you know, that doesn't seem to be an obviously impossible scenario, but that's precisely what Trent would have to rule out in order to infer uh, the atemporality or the timelessness of the being in question. Remember that my argument was that because the ultimate cause of all change is itself changeless, it would follow that the cause must be timeless since time is a measure of change. Now, Schmidt claims in response that one could conceive of a world where time passes, but one thing in that world is immutable, it never changes. But that allegedly immutable, unchangeable thing, it, it would experience change in the sense that its, its temporal duration would be constantly changing. It would get a certain amount of time older. It would be changing along the, the four-dimensional block universe. If, however, these are mere Cambridge changes, which indeed they are, since something can quote-unquote get older solely in virtue of things wholly outside of that thing, well then, by Trent's own lights, this is perfectly compatible with immutability. Trent himself, if I recall correctly, appeals to Cambridge change in his debate with Ben Watkins. And so Trent's point here doesn't hold water. Moving on to uh, his fifth question, is it material? Um, his main thing is just that, uh, his main claim was that matter is always changing. You know, that is kind of plausible, but it's it's still questionable in some regards. Like, presumably we don't have access, epistemic access, at least at present, to the, the sort of whatever is the fundamental layer, the fundamental ultimate layer of material physical reality, if there is one, of course. But if that's the case, that we don't really have epistemic access to it because we, we don't experience it, plausibly it might be beyond our, our current technological capacities, our scientific investigations, you know, we can only get so, so low into the quantum realm, right? If that's the case, well then we might be able to sort of inductively infer that, you know, well, if all the, uh, if if all the things, if all the material things that we've encountered are changeable or changing, excuse me, then whatever this fundamental thing is also changing. Like we might be able to do that, but uh, it doesn't seem as though we can sort of confidently say that matter as such is always changing, precisely because we don't really have epistemic access to that, uh, or plausibly we don't have uh, epistemic access, at least at present, to whatever that fundamental ground layer of, of physical reality is, that, that deepest, uh, most ultimate layer, as it were. The objection is that Yes, we, we do observe change in matter, and we're confident that even things that look like they aren't changing, like a, a stone statue, uh, they are changing. There are a bunch of whirring electrons zooming all around. But what if, the objection goes, the fundamental matter in the universe, like whatever makes up quarks or strings, maybe it just doesn't follow the same rules, and so the fundamental matter of space doesn't change. There's a debate in philosophy over what the most fundamental particles are. Is matter made of simples or gunk? Gunk is something you can divide forever and never reach an indivisible point. A simple, on the other hand, is something that cannot be divided. So maybe the most fundamental part of reality are these unchanging, indivisible points. So on the first option, the gunk, if something can be divided forever, then it can be changed forever. So my argument about the changeability of matter is still strong. It remains. But even an indivisible point, it would still undergo local change. If all the fundamental matter never changed at all, even in things like location or velocity, then the universe itself, it would be static, since the universe is just an arrangement of this fundamental matter. This is untrue, however, if the macroscopic things aren't mere arrangements of the fundamental subatomic things or thing, 
but are instead caused by, or realized by, or whatever, the fundamental thing or things. Indeed, this is precisely the case with certain views in philosophy of physics. As I put it in my recent response to Video to Trent, a temporal wave function monism, a view on which there exists a fundamental physical non-spatial temporal entity, uh, is a perfectly respectable view that has seen a blossoming of interest in philosophy of physics. And this thing, uh, it's variously construed, but one way to characterize its relation to um, less fundamental spatiotemporal physical things is by functional realization. Uh, but anyway, we don't need to get into that. That's a little bit complicated. So let's just move on to the next clip. The argument for the unlimited nature of this being, he, he was arguing that it contradicts pure actuality because uh, having some limit entails having some unrealized potentiality. It, it seems to me that that's just like a clear non sequitur. No, like limits do not automatically correspond to some unrealized potentiality, right? Like, um, I'm limited in so far as, you know, like I can't run as fast as a cheetah, but I clearly don't even have the potentiality to run as fast as a cheetah. That just goes beyond my nature. Like, that's just not in the, the very nature or character of my muscles and my bones and so on. That's just, that's just beyond my human nature, right? And so, even though I'm limited in that regard, I don't have potentialities in that regard. It seems eminently and obviously possible for there to be necessarily had and essentially had limits on things such that they don't entail the potentiality for being different or for being otherwise. And hence, being limited is perfectly compatible with being pure actuality because its limits could simply be necessarily actual. They would have no potential to be otherwise, no potential to be different. And so this being could be limited in countless respects. Um, it just does not follow that it contradicts pure actuality and it's just it seems to me just to be a straightforward non sequitur. Limitation does not by itself uh, contradict pure actuality. In, in fact, something can be extremely limited and yet be, uh, you know, purely actual. Is it necessary? Uh, well, I agree with his reasoning there. Uh, yeah, I mean, if it's purely actual, then it, it's going to be a, a necessary being, so. So I will add something now uh, to uh, my characterization there. So suppose limits are incompatible with being purely actual, as Trent would have it. Well, then Trent's view of God is incoherent. So it seems to me. For Trent's view of God is that God exists in three persons. But that's a limit in the number of persons God is. It's three instead of four or five or one or a billion or infinitely many. And in that case, God can't be purely actual because we're supposing that limits are indeed incompatible with being purely actual. Schmidt is sort of on the right track when he was talking about natures and potentiality. So for example, I'm even more limited than Schmidt in that I can't even run as fast as the average high school track athlete. But I do have the potential to run that fast if something actualized it in me, like physical training. Of course, physical training is never going to get me as fast as a cheetah. In order to, to do that, you might have to change my human nature through some weird animal splicing experiments or cybernetic limbs, things that I don't recommend. So the limits we have do depend in some way on our natures, our potentialities. But since God's nature is just existence itself, it follows he has no potentials of any kind. His nature is not limited in the way our natures are limited because God doesn't have a nature per se. Sure, but God still satisfies various predicates essentially, like omniscience and omnipotence and so on. Regardless, this is tangential to my point. My point is that limitation doesn't entail potency, since something can be essentially and necessarily limited in some respect in which case it doesn't even have the potential to increase or decrease in that respect. In fact, Trent himself has to say this, right? God is essentially necessarily three persons. He doesn't even have the potential to be four persons. And so onward to Trent's five reasons for thinking that the purely actual cause is personal. I don't think uh, I'm going to go through each and every one of them, mainly because I'm extremely tired right now. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Um, okay, so he gives, he gives five reasons. First one is basically that the only immaterial concrete objects that we know of um, our minds, uh, you know, because it can't be like an abstract number. Abstract numbers don't cause anything. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't really have much to say about this point. I mean, it just doesn't strike me as very plausible. We could easily just take this as an argument for the existence of an immaterial concrete object that is non-mental, right? Like, we could actually, I mean, like, why? Like, why, why are these the only two exhaustive categories? Uh, either it's, um, uh, either it's a mind, or it's a concrete, non-mental object, or it's an abstract object. Like, why? Why are those? Why are these the only three options? Uh, why can't it be just an immaterial, non-mental, concrete object? Like, what's what's incoherent about? Like, what's incoherent about that? Um, it, it's just very questionable. It doesn't entail it at all, right? Like, oh well, merely from the fact that the only immaterial, concrete objects that we know of 
our minds. It, it just, that doesn't entail in, in any way, shape, or form that an immaterial concrete object is thereby a mind. This is an argument from skepticism. Notice that Schmidt doesn't propose any candidate for an immaterial, non-mental, concrete object. Instead, he just appeals to the fact that maybe there is some other type of cause out there we, we haven't discovered yet. And that's a bare possibility, which is why these arguments are not knockdown proofs, but I would say they still serve to make the existence of God much more likely than any other alternative hypothesis. So I don't find this plausible. Trent is the one offering a positive argument here. The onus is on Trent, then, to justify why the only immaterial objects that exist or could exist are concrete minds or else abstracta. Why, right? Where's the argument? I mean, just saying, well, uh, I can't think of anything else, as Trent might say in response, that clearly isn't an argument, right? That's not giving a reason. Moreover, why would you even expect to be able to think of something else? I mean, we're talking about something that is extremely, extremely far removed from our ordinary experience and ordinary categories of things. And I also address this argument in my video response to Trent's debate with Ben Watkins, so I kindly advise you to check that out with a little smiley face. It's so cute, isn't it? And then secondly, his, his reason was there are two kinds of explanations, scientific explanations based in sort of physical laws and mechanisms and personal explanations. Again, I, this just see... It seems to me to be very questionable. Like, why Why think these are exhaustive? A an exhaustive characterization would be either scientific or non-scientific, or personal or non-personal, right? Um, but why assume that the only non-personal explanations are scientific explanations in terms of physical laws and mechanisms? And why assume that the only non-scientific explanations are personal explanations? In fact, it just seems to be false, right? There are metaphysical explanations, right? Um, if we're trying to explain the unity of parts in terms of the substantial form of the... Uh, of a substance in question, right? That is a sort of formal causality. It's, it has nothing to do with person out, like personal explanations, and it also has nothing to do with like a sort of mechanistic sci scientific physical law explanation. It's a sort of metaphysical explanation in terms of formal causality. I don't know. I, this seems to me to be very implausible. Um, there seem to be other types of explanations, like metaphysical explanations. So you know, we can really um, do the hardcore metaphysics um, in trying to you know derive what this explanation would be like. We can't merely infer from the fact that it's not scientific, that it would thereby be personal. Like, no, that's this seems to be just a clear false dichotomy. I agree that scientific and personal are not mutually exclusive in the same way material and immaterial are mutually exclusive categories. So in comparison to my last argument, Schmidt does offer a possible third alternative, metaphysical explanations. But once again, I'm not sure what he means by that. It could mean that we can explain some states of affairs apart from science or personal agents. Uh, for example, there are no objects that possess the property of color but lack the property of shape. But even here, this is different than explaining an event like the universe coming to be from nothing. When it comes to causal explanations, I suppose Schmidt might say a universe coming to be from nothing it might have a metaphysical explanation, like such an event is necessary or universes are necessary, and so that explains it. But that's just another way of saying the matter and energy we normally associate with a scientific explanation of the universe coming to be, it has some other property as well, like necessity, that isn't, properly speaking, scientific in nature. But the bottom line is this, that if something comes to be from nothing, it can't have a scientific explanation because science relies on things that exist like matter and energy to do all of its explanatory work. So if that's out the door, then I'd say the door is wide open for an explanation that resides in something immaterial and causal at the same time, like the personal intentions of an agent. So here I'm going to get a little cheeky. I see when I wrote this, I was, I was getting a little cheeky. Uh, so we're getting cheeky. Uh, but uh, anyway, I say, ah, so God is personal, has intentions, and is an agent. Well, that's odd, given that Trent had just argued in a clip I didn't play that quote-unquote theistic personalism, whatever that means, um, uh, this term isn't really used at large in the literature uh, because it, uh, it allegedly captures maybe any non-classical theistic model of God, which is like, what? <laughs> there are so many of those, and they differ radically. Um, some of them affirm timelessness, impassibility, and immutability, but they simply deny simplicity. Uh, maybe God has a multiplicity of properties, or maybe God has an act of will that's numerically distinct from his act of being, or maybe God has uh, potential for cross-world variants or whatever. Um, it covers views that range from that to views on the other side of the spectrum that are like, 
uh, process theology and like open theism <laughs> and then views in the middle like neoclassical theism where um, God is temporal, God is passable, uh, but he still has comprehensive foreknowledge of the future and so on and he's not absolutely simple and so on. So it, I mean th this term is not helpful at all um, and usually it's used in a derogatory manner by just Thomists for the most part but oh and I should add primarily internet Thomists uh, in the literature, usually things like neoclassical theism, or open theism, or panentheism, or pantheism, or certain process theological views, and so on. Usually those terms are used. Um, so, anyway, let's just move on. Uh, I said, this is odd, right? <laughs> Given that Trent had just argued in a clip that I didn't play, that theistic personalism uh, implies that God is a person, and so is in the class or category or kind persons, in which case God would be posterior to that class or kind or category in Trent's argument. This is what he's arguing. And in that case, Trent argues God wouldn't be ultimate. Now, setting aside the fact that X is being in kind K doesn't entail that X is posterior to K, and also setting aside the fact that X is satisfy satisfying some predicate F doesn't entail that uh, X is in some kind of um, F things, uh, things that satisfy uh, the predicate F, or F hooded things, or Fness, um, doesn't follow that uh, well, anyway, there are lots of non sequiturs here, but even ignoring those non sequiturs, um, uh, Trent has here just said that God has intentions and is personal and is an agent. And so to be consistent, Trent will have to say that God is therefore in the class or kind or category of the agents, uh, in which case, by his own lights, by Trent's own lights, God would be posterior to that class or kind or category, in which case, even on Trent's own view, God wouldn't be ultimate. Aha, but analogical predication, you screech. Uh, I have two replies. First, Analogical, analogical predication is literal predication. It's a species of literal predication. And hence, even if God is only analogously an agent, it's still literally true that he is an agent. And per Trent's own reasoning, he is therefore in the class or kind or category of agents. Second, the quote-unquote theistic personalist, whatever that means, uh, the theistic personalist can equally say that God is only analogously a person. And so if this move helps Trent avoid the problem, problem well, then Trent's argument against theistic personalism fails. <laughs> More fundamentally, though, my point about metaphysical explanation was simply to illustrate that Trent's claim that there are only two kinds of explanations for physical phenomena, personal and scientific, is false. Trent's argument rests on a false premise. That's my point. The onus isn't on me to spell out some metaphysical explanation of the universe or even to offer positive proposals here or candidates. The onus is on Trent to prove that these are the only two kinds of explanation uh, of the relevant fact or facts, and he simply hasn't done that. Okay, finally, as I explained in my previous video response to Trent regarding his debate with Ben Watkins, even granting that metric time had a beginning, there are whole panoplies of non-personal, non-scientific, but nevertheless non-theistic potential explanations or causes of the beginning of metric time. By non-scientific, I just mean um, they aren't amenable to our current methods of scientific investigation. Um, but nevertheless, non-theistic potential explanations or causes of the beginning of metric time, and thus Trent's argument fails. So see the section in there on the claw. The third reason was that, well, it explains the existence of abstract objects. I'm, <laughs> I put that in there as like, what? It's like, where did that come from? Like, where was that argued for? Like, that was not in the opening statement. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's the main criticism. It's just like, what? Like, wh where did this come from? I, I guess I just don't have much, much to say other than like, that just was, was just not justified in the opening statement. Uh, somehow we just got, that this being is the source or like the explanation of, of abstract objects. Not only was it not argued for, but, it does seem implausible. So if, if you're curious, you can check out my video, um, non-classical or non-traditional arguments for theism. I went through maybe like 10 different problems for a sort of theistic grounding or, or causation or some sort of divine activity that uh, accounts for or explains or uh, is the source of abstract objects. I went over different like bootstrapping problems that that's going to run into. Um, so for instance, it seems that there would always already have to be a proposition describing that or like reporting God's existence, for instance, like God exists, or God is even capable of having thought, or God is even capable of grounding abstracta, right? It would seem as though those propositions would already have to exist, as it were, ontologically prior to God's actually uh, doing the grounding or doing the sourcing, right? And so um, uh, if that's the case, well, then there would already have to be propositions prior to God's exercising any explanatory power with respect to, to abstracta, um, and hence they couldn't be explained or sourced or, or grounded in some sort of activity of God's. But anyway, that's getting a little bit too ahead of myself. Yeah, definitely check out that video for for an elaboration. He also said, like, abstracta only exist in a mind. It's just like, what? It wasn't justified. And, you know, granted, I mean, he only has 15 minutes, and, you know, I, I have this whole video to myself, but I guess I can just only say that uh, it just was not sufficiently justified. 
yeah, there, there was no reason given for why these things only exist in a mind. I will offer a mea culpa on this argument in that I should have fleshed it out more in the debate. As you know, 15 minutes is a, it's a short amount of time. Uh, a similar argument can be found in Ed Fazer's book, Five Proofs for the Existence of God. I think it's called The Augustinian Proof. So for those interested, uh, I've addressed the Augustinian proof at length in my video here, uh, link here. The video is actually drawing from my book manuscript under review uh, right now entitled, not all of it draws from it, there's there's new stuff in the video as well. And there's boatloads of stuff, of course, in the book that isn't in the video. Uh, but anyway, um, the video is actually drawing from my book manuscript under review right now entitled Existential Inertia and Classical Theistic Proofs. Uh, spoiler alert, the argument fails, so uh, sorry for the spoilers, I'm not sorry. And theistic conceptualism also has a host of difficulties on its own. You can see, for instance, my video with Dr. Felipe Leon here. Uh, indeed, abstract objects worthy to exist would pose rather serious challenges by my lights uh, to God's existence, as William Lane Craig, again by my lights, quite forcefully argues, uh, and as Felipe Leon and I argue in the aforementioned video. So let's move on to uh, some clips next. And then his fifth one was that moral properties sort of presuppose a transcendent moral source to account for or ground their existence. And because morality has to do with persons or, uh, you know, concerns the realm of persons, right, um, this being would be personal. Like, there are a number of problems with this. First of all, uh, it just was not justified why morality necessarily presupposes or moral truths necessarily presuppose some sort of transcendent moral source. From what I could gather, it seemed to be uh, just an assertion, which is fine. I mean, you know, he, he only has 15 minutes, so I can't really fault him. The second thing that I want to say in, in response to this is that Merely from the fact that the intentional objects of various moral truths concern what persons do, it doesn't follow that what grounds those moral truths, whose intentional objects are persons, it doesn't follow that whatever grounds those has to be a person. Like, that's just a non sequitur. Even if we granted that there's some sort of transcendent moral source, some grounding of morality, right, it does not follow. Right? It does not follow that it must be a person thereby, merely from the fact that the intentional objects of various moral truths uh, have to do with persons and what they do. Right? It's just a non sequitur. And my argument was that if properties like the moral law exist, it only makes sense if they are grounded in some kind of personal element. Part of that comes from their imperative force. If a box of Scrabble tiles spills over and it says, go home, I don't have an obligation to obey them. If my wife sends a text that says, go home, I have a reason to obey. And it's not just any person, mind you, that has this imperative force over me. If a stranger tells me to go home, I might politely ignore that weirdo. He doesn't have authority over me. Well, my wife has a different level of standing with me than a stranger. So the order, the, the request or order, gets more force behind it as the authority of the, of the person issuing the order increases. Well, if God is perfect goodness itself, then his commands to us have a universal and non-negotiably binding force behind them. So I would say that the argument still stands that whatever created the universe has some kind of personal element to it because morality is ultimately irreducible to the, the duties and rights that persons have. Schmid may well say it could be grounded in something else, and I'd like to know what that is. Possibility is not the same thing as probability. So Trent asks, what is it, right? What's the grounding? Well, I say it varies by cases. I mean, suppose I promise to meet you tomorrow. Well, I thereby have an obligation. I mean, perhaps a prima facie obligation if we want to follow, say, Ross's deontological framework or other ones that are kind of inspired by Ross, but set that aside. Um, I thereby have an obligation to meet you tomorrow. Well, what grounds am I having this obligation? Well, the very nature of making promises, right? Uh, similarly, suppose that you can save a drowning child in the shallow pond right next to you at little to no cost to yourself. Well, you thereby have an obligation to do it. What grounds you're having this obligation? Well, the nature of the sufferer, the child, in part. In another part, the nature of drowning and how it affects its victims. And finally, the fact that it is easily within your power with little to no cost to yourself to save the victim. Whether or not there's some fact entirely extrinsic to this situation, say a transcendent being commanded something, seems entirely irrelevant. What matters is the intrinsic facts about the situation itself. Uh, anyway, I simply refer people to the section of my video response to Trent's debate with Ben Watkins entitled Moral Argument. So just check that out for more. And then the final thing that I would probably say in response to this is just uh, there are lots of different problems with well, not only a bunch of these uh, bootstrapping and abstracted problems with um, saying that God somehow 
uh, has an activity, or may, maybe you're thinking that they're grounded in his nature, or maybe are they grounded in his activity? Uh, if so, like, you know, how is this, how is this working? Like, how is this doing the grounding? How is this actually explaining things? And, you know, you've also got, like, the Euthyphro Dilemma, and then, of course, you've got the, the modified Euthyphro Dilemma in response to God's nature being the standard of goodness, or maybe God is identical to goodness. Definitely check, check out um, Jeremy Coons's work on this. Actually, he just recently did a, a podcast with, uh, on the Thoughtology podcast, um, with Alex Malpass, so definitely check that out as well. I'm not going to engage this because Schmidt is just kind of raising objections without you know, really expanding on them, uh, which I understand because he recorded this response kind of off the cuff at like two in the morning, so that's fine. I understand. So I can definitely see how I could be interpreted as raising objections here, uh, but my ultimate aim was mainly just to direct people to other problems that they can look into. That's why, for instance, I directed people to the discussion between Dr. Alex Malpass and Dr. Jeremy Coons. But this is a minor point, so let's move on. Uh, but I will say is that classical theism has the best chance of defeating the Euthyphro dilemma. Uh, this dilemma says God either has no relation to morality or morality becomes totally arbitrary under God. But classical theism explains why God is essentially good, given his status as pure actuality without any deficiencies, and badness is some kind of deficiency of the good. So God would be the ultimate standard of goodness itself, rather than merely submitting to a standard or making morality dependent on something like his will or his power alone. So I think this is mistaken. I argue that classical theism has no advantages whatsoever over non-classical theistic models of God when it comes to the Euthyphro Dilemma. Uh, in my video, Arguments for Classical Theism, Part 1 out of 2. There are even timestamps with section labels, so check out the section entitled Euthyphro Dilemma from uh, these timestamps here. Uh, Trent then gives a moral argument for God, and so let's turn to that. Okay, so I'm not going to discuss much of what he says there in much detail, mainly because I'm quite tired. Uh, <laughs> but like he was saying that like God creates moral facts, like he specifically used that, and you know, it's just like, that is, that just seems so implausible. I mean, uh, surely God is free to create things or not. God is, is radically free. This is a core tenet of classical theism, right? God is radically free in his creative act, such that he could have refrained from creating anything at all. And hence, it follows that anything that he creates is contingent. But truths about morality are not contingent, right? These things are necessarily true. It is necessarily true. It cannot be false. Uh, and it is a necessarily a fact that torturing babies for fun is never morally permissible. That is a, that is necessarily a fact. And hence, um, if we take what Trent said seriously, that God creates moral facts, but yet moral facts are necessary, but yet God is free to create anything apart from himself or not, now we have a sort of inconsistent triad. Like, which is it? Is God necessarily compelled to create something? Or is it only, like, contingently true that it's a fact? You know, is it only contingently a fact that, you know, torturing babies for fun is immoral or what, or what have you? So the objection here seems to be that if moral facts are necessary or they are always true, then God can't be said to have freely created them, since if they are necessary, they must exist. Now, I agree God was not free to create immoral facts, like it could be good to torture babies for fun. But that's because the, those facts contradict God's essentially good nature. I think the important point to have here is that necessary truths can be grounded in other necessary truths. For example, the necessary truth 2 plus 2 equals 4 is grounded in the Peano axioms of arithmetic. Pino? Peano? Uh, you know, those related to identity and addition, things like that. In the same way, necessary truths related to math or modality or morality, uh, they exist, but they exist as reflections of God's perfect and necessary uh, existence himself as pure being itself. <laughs> Look at what I wrote here. Hold on a second, my dude. <laughs> it is Wednesday, my dudes. Uh, you, I probably didn't upload this on a Wednesday, but it is Wednesday, my dudes. Ah! Anyway, I'm, I'm referring to a vine. Um, it's a, it's in a, it's an appropriate vine. I, I'm not, it's, you can watch it. Look it up. It is Wednesday, my dudes. Look that up on YouTube. Anyway, after you finish this video, my video. Okay. <laughs> we're, we're, we're moving on. Hold on a second, my dude. We weren't talking about grounding. Trent specifically and explicitly said that God creates moral facts in his opening statement. It was this claim that I capitalized on. And Trent said nothing here to address my point there. He shifted focus to necessary things or facts or truths, grounding other necessary things or facts or truths. But we aren't talking about grounding. We're talking about sex, baby. We're talking about you and me. <laughs> 
Man, I have gone insane. We're talking about creating, okay? Uh, the inconsistent triad is as follows. One, God is free to create or refrain from creating anything apart from himself. Two, moral facts are created by God. And three, moral facts are necessary. All the good things and the bad things that may be. Let's talk about creating. Let's talk about creating. Okay. Uh, thesis one. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm losing my voice. I, I would be able to sing better if I had my voice back. Trust me. Don't trust me. Trust me. Um, thesis one is a core tenet of, of classical theism. Trent explicitly affirms thesis two in his opening statement, and thesis three is just self-evident, okay? So something has to go then. Either classical theism or Trent's claim in his opening statement, to which I was responding, by the way, that's one that's going to have to go, uh, or else the self-evident truth. And so let's, let's just skip the next couple of minutes on the Euthyphro Dilemma since we've already touched on that. Uh, and then one final thing is just like, um, there's, yet again, it's a non sequitur that he's trying to say like, oh, well, God is, is wholly good. He's omnibenevolent because he's the source of goodness, right? But that, it just doesn't follow. It doesn't follow from the fact that X grounds or creates or is the source of or is the foundation of or explains or accounts for moral facts that it itself exemplifies moral properties or that it itself is good or that, uh, you know, it itself is all good, right? I mean, even if we granted that, um, you know, being the ground of morality is in some sense, you know, a, a great making feature. Okay, fair enough. I mean, that, that seems somewhat plausible, although, you know, that's contestable. That would need to be demonstrated. But even if we granted that, it would not follow that it's all good, that it's wholly good, that it's omnibenevolent, that it's morally perfect. That seems to be a non sequitur. I mean, again, merely from the fact that something is the source or the foundation of morality doesn't follow that uh, it is thereby good or especially all good. That when would we say this in any other field? Uh, that'd be like saying the laws of logic are the foundation of a logical system, but it doesn't follow that the laws are perfectly logical. They could have some illogic mixed into them. That doesn't follow if they are the source by which we determine what is and isn't logical. We do it all the time. Uh, consider that God is the foundation or source or ultimate explanation of physical, limited, contingent things by Trent's own lights. But it obviously doesn't follow from this that God is himself physical or limited or contingent. Thus, merely from the fact that X is the foundation of Y, or for Y's being F, or that X is the source of Y, or Y's being F, or that X is the ultimate explanation of Y, or of Y's being F, it clearly doesn't follow that X itself is or has F. And so Trent's point here is entirely unconvincing. Anyway, we have reached the conclusion. Um, many thanks to Trent. Much love to Trent and all you guys who have watched this. I hope this has served you. I hope this has benefited you. At the very least, I hope it's broadened your perspective, opened up your horizons, and allowed you to think critically about the fundamental nature of reality, about God, our place in the universe, and, and, and so on, and even about stupid paper passers who have to check a piece of paper and write their number on it, and things like that. Um, you know, anyway, again, the purpose of my videos, as I like to emphasize, is to help you guys think critically about the fundamental nature of reality. Whether or not you agree with the conclusions that I come to is mostly beside the point. I mean, obviously, because I think that the conclusions are true, I'd like for you to have true beliefs as well. But what matters more to me, what matters far more to me than the conclusions themselves is the process. It's the process, right? It's, it's the process of critical thinking, critical and reflective thought, philosophizing, searching truth with an honest and open heart and mind, and just yeah, following truth wherever it leads, and using the skills and tools and methods of critical thinking and analytic philosophy, drawing distinctions and, and building and constructing arguments and criticizing them and just being very careful, cautious, clear, rigorous, precise, and so on. That's the ultimate aim of all of this, right? Just to, to help you, to give you tools to think about the fundamental nature of reality, to think critically about these sorts of things. That's my whole ethos. That's what my first book uh, on Amazon is about. That's what my channel is about. That's what I'm about. So anyway, again, many thanks to Trent. Much love to all. Consider becoming a patron. Thank you. And consider a one-time donation. Links in the description. I'm Joe Schmid. This is The Majesty of Reason. And peace out.